Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Doctor of Chinese Medicine, Roger Junka. Hello and welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today I have a very special guest to help us all deal with the turbulent times we're going through worldwide. Roger Jonka is an oriental medical doctor with extensive experience as a pioneer in energy healing research and is a master of Tai Chi and Qigong. Additionally, he is the author of two great books I'll share in the podcast. Unlike most traditional Tai Chi and Qigong masters, Dr. Jonka also has a lot of experience with shamanism and has worked directly with highly regarded shaman and has a working understanding of plant medicines and much more. Dr. Jonka is what I call a deep well. We have a deep and meaningful conversation, and he even offered a few practical techniques you can practice while you're listening to the podcast or watching it. Some of the key points we dialogued on this podcast are what qi actually is, what is the difference between tai chi and qigong, how the Chinese figured out their elemental theory and created tai chi and qigong, why a gong practice is important and the difference in the number of days of a gong given by masters in China versus those in the U.S. or Western world. We explore a very powerful quote by Thomas Jefferson that Dr. Jonka shares in his book, The Healer Within, and we discuss what enlightenment actually is. We explored the challenges with our education system worldwide and talked about what Confucius taught and how that differed from Lao Tzu's teachings. We discuss what Dr. Jonka calls the three treasures, and we talk about correlations between my four-doctor system and the essential lifestyle approaches that he practices and teaches. Dr. Jonka also shares his powerful experiences with shaman in his life. I left this interview with Dr. Jonka feeling calmer inside and more reassured in my own teachings and philosophy, which has many parallels with his own. I'm confident that anyone suffering nervousness or anxiety over these issues that we're facing today will leave this podcast experience more relaxed, confident, and reassured as to what is truly important in life and ways we can stay grounded and centered, as well as contributing to world healing together. Enjoy Dr. Jonka. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, our subject is the healer within. And I have a very impressive man who's got a lot of experience at the healer within, and that's Dr. Roger Jonka, who's an oriental medical doctor. He's a master of Tai Chi and Qigong with over 40 years of experience in these fields and is a pioneering researcher in the fields of Tai Chi, Qigong, and energy medicine. Dr. Jonka has traveled the world, studied with many masters, conducted numerous trips to China with groups to study and practice the inner arts, and is a catalyst to the awakening and vitalization of countless thousands of people worldwide, and probably many more than that. Dr. Jonka has numerous instructional videos on his YouTube channel, The Tai Chi and Qigong Way that are very informative, that anyone can learn a lot from. I know because I've checked out several of them myself. He's also the author of two excellent books, which I've had a chance to look through, and I highly recommend both of them. uh, His first book is The Healer Within, and the second one is The Promise of Key. So Dr. Jonka, which he's allowed me, he said, I can call him Roger. He's a cool, he's a cool cat. This guy, he's not stuffy. (laughs) So uh, Roger, welcome to living 4d. It's really cool to be able to talk to you. I'm excited to get into all these things with you because I think the world needs it now more than ever. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Paul, thank you so much. I have uh, done a little research on you and found you to be a, um, a, um, uh, what do they call that? Like a polymath, you know, a person <laughs> who's got like a just a lot of uh, fascinating points of um, points of reference. And I think that in these times, if a person's view is shrunk to just this is my thing and that's that, um, you know, the, the humans are going down. So if uh, and and it could be that you know. The humans going down anyway. It might be too late, or who knows? It might be too early. We don't know what the next evolutionary leap is, and whether it's technology or or, or, or organic life uh, or just pure chi. 
and we don't know where we are in the universe. So it's a good, I think it's a really good thing to know a lot about a lot or even a little about a lot so that you can reinforce your own sovereign intelligence and, um, you know, mine into your own being for your point of view. I think so too. And I think, um, you know, we'll get into this more as we go, but I think our education system is very, very broken. And, you know, one of my favorite little definitions is the definition of a specialist. Have you heard that one? Is that the one about knows everything about something, but not a lot about everything? Or Go ahead. Close. A specialist is someone who knows more and more about less and less until they know absolutely everything about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, if we were if we were uh, non dualists, we would want to know everything about nothing. Right. Um, but it would be a different context. But you know, that's an interesting point there because having studied Chang Tzu, he had almost no education, sat in caves meditating, and in one of my books, it talks about how uh, prof university professors and guys that thought they were smart from all over the world made a long trip to come debate him and nobody could beat him in a debate, but he had no formal education whatsoever. And he talked about, you know, basically going into no mind and said that all the information is there for anybody. Hmm. I am a fan of Chuang Tzu for sure. Chuang Tzu, Lao Tzu, and all those crazy characters from those crazy Taoists from 2,500 years ago, um, somewhere around the conclusion of what we call the shamanic era. Yes, which we need, and we'll talk about that, but you know, we need that era back before we completely cut ourselves off from nature. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a cool definition of neo-shamanism that is, you know, new shamanism as opposed to old shamanism, and I'll just mention it. Very briefly, old shamanism, you have one unique character who's got all the information and everybody else is sort of laboring to, uh, shall we say, keep the society going. And this one person has like all the big magic, whereas now neo-shamanism is that we all have the magic. And I think that's what we're here to talk about today. Yeah, I think it's critical. And, you know... Shamanism in the past was was very tribal, as you know, and the shaman were were quite specialized people, often uh, initiated through some kind of significant circumstance, be it a poisonous snake bite or a lightning strike or some serious ailment of some kind or some some you know very distinct event. But I think today that in line with the concept of neo-shamanism, I think it's really important that people just learn how to reconnect with nature and learn how to relate to the elements and get back to more of a polytheistic or a pantheistic relationship. And, you know, one of the problems we have in the world is people have so detached themselves from the spirit that is the life force and everything. So everything's just become an object that we can just cut up slash burn and, and use but they don't realize that the things that they're killing are the things that basically give us our foundation our very very existence they that's what feeds us it's what keeps the earth functioning and so uh, i'm grateful that there's more of a shamanic awakening i just hope that you know that the corporations don't destroy everything we've got left before we can have anything to use in our shamanic practices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can't, I couldn't debate anything that you just said. I agree, you know, up, up and around a thousand percent. And <clears throat> what's really interesting is that we have, um, we'll leave the corporations to the side for the moment and let's go to the individuals, uh, the people who are listening to this podcast. And um, it's probably true that some major percentage of those individuals listening to this podcast think that things like special healing skill and shamanic insight and deep um, philosophical revelation are somehow isolated uh, and available to only, you know, certain types of uh, 
human beings who have special dispensation or something like that. But from my my experience, and this goes all the way back to my uh, grandmother, who was a you know, everybody thought she was like kind of a strange person. Uh, she was she used herbs. Um, she was into my grandmother was into this is really interesting. My grandmother was a part of an organization, a theosophical organization called the Universal Brotherhood of the Cosmic Age. And this Very was in, good. Like, you know, 1950, 1951, two, three, around in there. And, 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 and so my sense is that um, we have somehow figured out how to convince average people that they don't know enough. And therefore, when they have a problem, instead of doing research and expanding their view, they tend to um, default to the ideas of other people, you know, which is convenient. And particularly if we're hysterical and can't find our center and um, think that the sky is falling, even <laughs> if it may be. <laughs> uh, we we lose touch with our inherent. Well, actually, I have this favorite word. It's called inherency. We lose touch with our inherency, and uh, in the presence of not having a connection with our own brilliant, essential nature, we panic and and reach out to you know all kinds of weird television stations and. Well, of course, we reach to podcasts, and hopefully in podcasts like this one, what we do is we decondition people from that lack of self-reliance into an awakening. Yes. I think you're right on. And it's um, we also have a problem where people just don't, don't seem to have the discipline to do the work to find the answers for themselves instead of just looking for somebody else to tell them what they're supposed to know. And, you know, I, I, I like to quote Steiner, you know, without going through a long expose of his whole model of the soul, but he talks about first we have the mineral soul, then we have the biological soul, then we have the intellectual soul, which is the ego formation. But then he says, the next phase is the um, awareness soul. And he says the awareness soul is born when you honestly begin to question your own beliefs. So when, you when you're in a religious idea and you think if you don't uh, you know, do certain things or follow certain rules, God's going to burn you in hell, the day you say, well, is that really true? And you honestly look into it you begin to become aware. And instead of just acting out automated programming like a robot, you actually start asking questions like, why is it that vaccine manufacturers are making it impossible for you to have any recourse if they've made mistakes or poisoned you or damaged you? And why are they not following scientific protocols? And you, so you start asking critical questions. And instead of just doing what everybody else is doing, you really look at the evidence on both sides of an argument. And from there, you use your rational faculty and or talk to other people that have more knowledge in you than you do on a given topic that you trust are reliable and you come to an intelligent conclusion on your own, but you always keep your mind open that even that conclusion may be wrong. So, you you know, I find it's so important to do the work to answer your own questions, but also keep the door open for the messenger to come and say, ah, oh, but you didn't realize this was going on or that was going on. And that's the only way we can actually solve the problems that we have in the world or even in our own lives. Otherwise, you're just somebody else's play toy all the time. And, and all you got to do is look out the window to see how that's working or turn on any television station. And it's just it's just robotic, non-thinking behavior, which is extremely dangerous. And it's how isms get started. Mm, yeah. whenever, whenever 
a culture's myth breaks down, isms start popping up. And that's how the Second World War got started. Yeah, and it goes back to then and even before. Um, but but I, th- this train of thought <clears throat> has, there's a, you know, there's a kind of a damnable rabbit hole that we could get lost in here. <laughs> That's okay. I've been. We like rabbit holes as long as they're, <laughs> long as they're taking us somewhere magical. Yeah. So, so uh, I'll hesitate to, um, uh, to to reference uh, the, shall we say, any particular part of the pharmaceutical industry at this point, um, but instead to take another uh, view at really the same question which is, how is it possible that, and and this is a question that you could have asked as easily in 1985, in 1990, 95, 2000, 2010, we didn't have to wait till today to feel like this is an important question or an important um, uh, point to be investigating. But if you were to ask, what is the most important thing that a person can do to uh, whether it's for infectious diseases or for chronic degenerative diseases? What is the most important thing that a person can do? And there aren't any voices in in except in the in the uh, ecosphere of podcasting and in the ecosphere of alternative. Um, news sourcing, and so forth, there is no one who ever says anything about the value of the innate immune function. So we talk all the time about the um, immune function that's developed by using pharmaceuticals, um, and everybody's talking about that all the time, whether you should or you shouldn't. But what I would like to, to just investigate for a few moments is why are we so stuck on what's called um, the, um, the immune system that is triggered by COVID itself or the immune system that's triggered by uh, vaccination without ever referencing what is the most important immune function, which is the naturally occurring essential innate immune function, which is there's plenty of, uh, there's plenty of research out there that shows that people who have the worst, uh, shall we say, chronic diseases and the worst infectious diseases tend to be people who don't exercise, who have a, a high carbohydrate diet, who use a lot of um, foods that come uh, in bags and boxes and so forth, and do not exercise and do not have a, and this is to me one of the most important things, they do not have a personal philosophy that he, that they have actually developed on their own so the whole concept of food intake water rest the chinese by the way the chinese did this like thousands of years ago they call it yang sheng yang sheng means nourishing life it doesn't mean curing disease it means maximizing function and we can talk about the chi and the functionality and we can go you know neurohacking and biohacking and all that stuff. I love those conversations. I hope we'll have them. But for right now, just at the top layer, whether it's for vaccines or not for vaccines, or whether it's for medications or not for medications, I want to know what happened to the discussion about function, natural inherency, natural function, which is also associated with our natural association with our transcendental self. Back to you. I can tell you what happened to that conversation. It got buried under a pile of gold in the hands of a very few people because that conversation leads to a reduction in uh, profitability off the people of the world. And it leads to intelligent people that know how to take care of themselves. And that, doesn't go with Rockefeller's business model, unfortunately. You, I don't know if you're familiar with my system, but I have what I call the four doctors. Are you familiar with that? No, go ahead. So basically, I teach all my students and patients and clients that 
A living philosophy cannot be reduced below these four key categories that you always have to be aware of in order to be a healthy person or achieve well-being. Dr. Happiness is the doctor that's in charge of all your values. And under Dr. Happiness, we're responsible for identifying what are the activities that are happy making for us, whether that be singing, dancing, exercise, art, uh, poetry, playing, uh, anything that's happy making, we have to be clear on what it is we need to do on a regular enough basis to be taking responsibility for our own happiness. And then under the umbrella of Dr. Happiness, there's Dr. Movement. So we always have to be attached to our instincts for movement and get enough movement to keep ourselves vital and healthy. Then we have to also be aware of Dr. Diet and what clean, organic, real foods and in what combinations is ideal for our unique metabolic needs from meal to meal. And we also have to be very respectful of Dr. Quiet because that's rest, it's (laughs) introspection, it's sleep, and it's inner work. It's time to be in yourself with your own soul and having a relationship with yourself. So I have proven over and over and over again in my 37 years of being a therapist, there's no such thing as a healthy three doctor person. You could be a master of exercise, a master of diet, and do all the happy making things, but de- be deprived on sleep and not un- understand why you're breaking down. No matter which way you go, you can't reduce a healthy living philosophy below taking responsibility for your happiness, your movement, your diet, and your rest. If you don't have those four factors in place, you're always going to be a statistic in some medical way, and you're always going to be paying dearly for it. Hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, again, cannot argue with that at all. I think that the Chinese would, um, you know, they like the idea that there's a, a, a different number of doctors, but what, it, what all that really matters is where is that doctor? And within. the answer is <laughs> the doctor is within along with uh, all the medicine. So let's just say, let me put out my, one of my favorite lines is, The most profound medicine is produced within the human system for free. So if you lived in a culture that was panicking about the cost of medicine, and the cost of medicine is annually about $3.5 trillion, what would happen if everybody just made the medicine that happens naturally within our own being for no cost? What would, what would we do with three and a half trillion dollars? And check this out. If you want to compare the amount of money that we would have available in our society, if everybody did this, we can use the uh, war in Afghanistan as a, as a, as a, uh, as a kind of a ruler for this war in Afghanistan, two and a half trillion dollars in 20 years. American cost annually of, of medical care, medical industrial complex, three and a half trillion dollars every year. So when you think about those big planes that you can put four or five tanks in there, you can put an entire building, a couple of buildings inside of those planes and fly them back and forth and all those sur- soldiers and all the food and all the ammunition and everything that's associated with being in Afghanistan for 20 years and that being 2.5 trillion and that the annual every year cost of what we call healthcare which is actually just paying the medical industrial complex to treat preventable diseases which is like embarrassing to even say it out loud. It is. It's terribly embarrassing. It's disgusting. And it's disgusting that it's been going on for so long. I don't care who's getting rich off it. It's just downright wrong. Period. I like that. Down, right, wrong. <laughs> it's just crooked, backwards. It's it's unhealthy. It's unintelligent. It's a uh, a business model that has no moral connection to 
the ramifications of continuing to apply it, not to mention the fact that the toxicity generated in people's bodies because they participate in that model and the progressive spin down because they're never actually being taught what it is that led to the chronic inflammation or why they have a gallbladder that doesn't work. It's it's allopathic. It's this for that medicine. It's not looking at the etiology of things. And it's 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 uh you know it's a symptom of this mechanical approach to the human being as a biological robot, which is now growing into transhumanism. And when people have lost touch with the fact that we breathe 25,900 breaths a day that comes from the environment, we eat food from the environment, we drink water from the environment, we get light from the environment, our solar plexus is actually interfacing with the biological environment around us. And people forget that the plant kingdom is an organ that lives outside of us. We don't have the ability to convert sunlight into carbohydrate in our body. So we're dependent upon the plant kingdom as an external organ. So if we keep spraying everything with poisons and burning and slashing so we can make more hamburgers from McDonald's and cheap clothing, then next thing you know, you're living off of genetically modified crap and pills out of bottles and packaged foods. But by the time that stuff gets to you, the life force is so dead that you're actually, you know, what what I show in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, a lot of people don't understand. It takes 55% of the calories and nutrition you bring in to run a food stuff from mouth to anus just to eat it, digest, metabolize, assimilate, and eliminate. The problem is most people are eating food that doesn't have enough nutrition to even cover the cost of running the food from mouth to anus. So every meal they go into a deficit and then they're running to doctors with fatigue and this ailment and that ailment and global inflammation. They forget that they're eating herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, rodenticides, emulsifiers, stabilers, chemicals, Stabilizers, chemical colorings. I mean, 68,000 chemicals in food plus now. It's, it's like, what happened to paying attention to what life is all about and, and having a relationship with life itself instead of a television screen or a phone? It's just off the Richter scale. Yeah. So, so one of the things, I mean, we want to talk about cosmology and quantum physics and ancient cultures and homeopathy and, you know, whatever, wherever you want to go. But let's just go for a moment to the question of how hard is it to pay down the digestion and nourishment debt? How, what is the cost of paying off our rest debt? And, and the answer, people think, well, that's going to be very complex. I'm going to have to become an expert in all these things. It's going to be, I'm going to have to figure out how to buy stuff that's going to, you know. But let's just pass, and there's plenty of cool stuff to buy. I understand that. But let's just talk about what we can do without buying anything. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why I got so involved in uh, what the Chinese call qigong which basically means just uh, maximizing function. If we were going to talk about the qigong of the planetary system, then we would think about, well, how does a planetary system maximize its function? But we mostly want to talk about ourselves and our friends and our family. And so what is it that we can do that, um, that has no cost and that takes almost no time and so uh, let me just introduce for a moment here this concept of Qigong and uh, what it is in operational terms is basically what we call the four dimensions or the four baskets of practice. And those four baskets of practice are body practice, breath practice, and... Cheers. Um, <laughs> I'm having a little... Qigong in a bag called 
some vaporized herbs and clean tobaccos. <laughs> well, I'm going to take a deep breath too. Go for it. Oh yeah, thank you for that. I'll, Th- I'll this take is, it in. I'll, bl- I'll, I'll blow you some smoke here. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Some so yeah, we can say, "Hey, what are you smoking, dude?" Or, "Hey, he's blowing smoke." Actually, there's no smoke. It's just water vapor. It's a vaporizer. <laughs> there's actually no smoke. It looks like smoke, and I call it smoke, but it's healthy smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar. So anyway, back to the dimensions of things that we can do that have no cost, a body practice, which we can actually do in, in a moment, a breath practice, which we can, if we are doing, you're holding your breath. I'm, I'm, I'm not holding mine because I'm speaking. Then uh, a mind focusing practice and a self applied massage practice. So that's a body practice, a breath practice, a mind focusing practice, and a self applied massage practice. So all of those, a body practice we can do, we'll just do it right now. Adjust your posture by sitting up straight and putting your head on top. Drop your shoulders. A breath practice, take a deep breath. Do that now, Paul. Got it. And, uh, and and we can talk a little bit more about breath practice. Actually, I have uh, we've we've made a program called Breath Medicine. Maybe we can talk a little bit about it. Where um, there is four different types of breath practice, which are like absolutely simple, and we can teach everybody how to do it here in two minutes. And then mind practice is. Um, you know, we have a mind that's ha- work, that's working all the time. We're in a little more control of it when we're awake, if we are in fact awake. <laughs> and we have a little less control of it when we're sleeping. Um, but uh, so we'll talk about mindfulness and meditation, I'm sure. And then self-applied massage. Well, you know, think of it this way. Chinese medicine goes back 30,000 years. 50,000 years. Um, the human gene is three trillion, three million, uh, three billion years old, three billion years. So, what happens to a gene as it evolves over three billion years, three, whenever it is? It, it might be trillion. I can't remember. The universe is how old and so forth. But the point is that um, it's probably unlikely that. People who are what we call humans, when once they learned how to make a family, which they did three billion years ago, you know, what was next? Well, they probably gestured and made sounds, and then later they talked to each other. Well, how long ago did we talk to each other? How long ago was the first person who said, you know, could you rub my neck just a little bit because I've been, you know, out hunting uh, elephants all day? Whatever. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. So, yeah. But the point is that those four baskets of practice do not cost anything. Adjust your posture, move the body. Okay, move, move fast, move slow, do flexibility, do Tai Chi like flowing, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's so many different kinds of body movement. How many kinds of breath practice are there? It doesn't cost anything to take a, diff- a different kind of a breath. How much does it cost to shift the. Uh, the focus of your mind and how much does it cost to use your thumb or any other part of your hand to do some kind of massage on your on your body so all that stuff is free and last little thing on that is well when do i have time to do it and here's <laughs> here's two 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 answers to that one is that when you wake up in the morning do you get out of bed right away Answer, no. So you can start your practice as soon as you wake up for free. All kinds of things that you can do there. You can breathe there. You can chant some kind of uh, gratitude there. You can hold a mind focus. You can make an affirmation, whatever you want to do. You can put your body in different positions in the bed before you get up. Um, So waking up is a really good time to do you know, I think self-care is kind of like, I don't like the word that much because it's just it's like, well, why would I take care of myself? I have doctor to do that. But on the other hand, self-care is so powerful. So we can call it self 
implemented resiliency maximization or something like that. Well, I would just call it having a relationship with yourself. What a concept. <laughs> How about getting to know the magic and the mystery of a hundred trillion cells, each made of each cell made of a hundred trillion atoms and say, holy shit, <laughs> what in the hell is going on here? This is a miracle. Somebody put my soul, which is a miracle in itself, inside of another miracle. And what do I do? I treat it like shit and forget all about it and expect some doctor to take care of me. I mean, that's what it is. It's called having a relationship with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! I'm applauding now. I think that's a that's a top that's a top idea, dude. Well, you know, if there's more you wanted to share on that, please do. I just well, we can come back to it. The the key point is that the most profound medicine is produced in the human body for free. That there are things that you can do. The the Chinese call that Yang Sheng. You can look that up, Yang Sheng. There's plenty of information on the on Google about that. That the four baskets of practice are the uh, body practice, breath practice, mind-focusing practice, and self-applied massage practice, and none of them cost anything, and they all turn on the medicine within, or what the Chinese, by the way, call the elixir within. That's the Chinese alchemical approach. Yeah, which is a whole other conversation, which we can have too if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, well, we got lots of questions to get through, so we'll have plenty to talk about. My life's mission, my legacy, has always been to teach the teachers. When I founded the Czech Institute, it wasn't to teach the masses. It was specifically to create masters that could impact the masses and reach far more people than I ever could. Just as a picture is worth a thousand words, a master has more power to help and heal than a thousand average healthcare professionals. If you listen to my podcast, then I'm confident you're already aware that the world is in a health crisis. This crisis isn't something that would be a crisis for healthy people with the wisdom to support the planet in healthy ways, as most native cultures did. It's a health crisis because of corporate greed and manipulation of the truth of what makes people healthy by the medical systems worldwide. Sadly, they're in the illness and disease business, not the healthcare business. The mission of the Academy is to teach the teachers how to live and how to teach holistic health for both the professionals of the world and the masses. How the Czech Academy does this is by providing you with all of my courses, Academy-only online seminars, and business training so you know how to run an effective holistic health business. It's structured so that you get the right training at the right place with the right mentors to succeed. Students are supported by group mentorships and a community of like-minded students. It's much easier to learn, grow, and share when you have a tribe of intelligent, healthy, inspired, and motivated people, and that's exactly what the Czech Academy offers you. Great teachers are people who live or have lived what they preach. In the Academy, you will be taught by masterful instructors that model for you every step of the way what it is that you're meant to do, how to live, and what to teach. Learning from masters in a mastermind group setting will help you grow personally and professionally and create a practice you know truly helps people. If you're interested in applying to the Czech Academy to be the change the world needs now, go to chekinstitute.com forward slash L number 4D Academy. That's chekinstitute.com forward slash L4D Academy to apply now. I, I looked into your history and, and wow, you have got a very comprehensive uh, life of really exploring this stuff deeply and in a lot of different ways. So I think what would be fun for everybody to establish a little credibility and depth, aside from the fact that you're an oriental medical doctor and everybody, most everybody knows that's, you know, a serious course of study. That's not something easy to do. Um, I've taught at the Pacific College of Oriental, Medi uh, Oriental Medicine many times and and uh, am very familiar with that and have worked with acupuncturists and Oriental Medical, Oriental Medical doctors my whole career. Uh, so I'm quite familiar. I've used them numerous times. But I'd love it if you could just share your process and what led you to this passion and study of Tai Chi, Qi Gong, energy medicine, all these things. I mean, that's there's a lot of, of commitment there and a lot of depth. So 
I'd love it if you just take us on this journey of of how you became, <laughs> first of all, interested, in, and then what what inspired you to penetrate so deeply. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Paul. Well, I would say the first thing is that <clears throat> it was all, but in in terms of dimensional perception in the time space that we live in as human beings, it was all caused by what I would call accidents. So the first accident is that I was born into a family that had one grandmother who was like a a, a little bit of a shaman in her own right. She was a Catholic, uh, a devout Catholic, but every Wednesday evening, she attended a meeting with a bunch of other people that was called the Universal Brotherhood of the Cosmic Age. And so that was a part of the ecosystem of my family as a child. The second thing, which is I think somewhere around an area of familiarity with you, is the um, accident that my dad, during the Second World War, was getting ready to go on to the beach in Japan when they set off the Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the plume of that um, blast uh, basically bathed all of those Marines in, in radiation. And so before his time, he was 39 when he died from leukemia. Wow. And the loss of my dad uh, as much as I pretended as a young person that I didn't care and that I was, you know, butch about it, and uh, all the all the men around were were soldiers, and so they would say, you know, keep a stiff upper lip, and you know, you're the man now, and all that stuff. And so I never really had the experience, the opportunity to grieve. So I put all of my my grieving into, you know bizarre behaviors. I started smoking cigarettes when I was like 11 years old. I ran away from home a lot. I never really got very good grades. Um, I hung around with strange people and so forth. And, and, and so that just, before that, I, I live, I'm from a place called Cincinnati, Ohio. So before that, I wanted to be a baseball player when I grew up, because, you know, everybody asks, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to be a baseball player. I'm going to play for the Cincinnati Reds and all that. Um, when my dad died, I, I, in reflection, I realized that pretty soon after that, I started to say in answer to that same question, I'm going to be a doctor. And so when I went to medical school, I asked this question. I said, is there someone here who can be a mentor for me? Because I'm less interested in uh, treating diseases and more interested in preventing diseases. And so, you know, the very, very, very short story about that is that these people would respond to me, the doctors who were leading the classes and so forth would say, well, you know, we're doctors. So we don't know anything about how to sustain health. We diagnose and treat disease. That's what doctors do. And so, uh, it was 1967. I was smoking a lot of uh, pot, and um, I dropped out of medical school. I grew my hair down to the sidewalk <laughs> and, um, and shifted into um, world literature. And the first book that we read in world literature was the Tao Te Ching. Right on. And the... The, and, and I'll just actually quote a little piece of it, because when I saw this piece of the Tao Te Ching, I said, I want to be a doctor for that. And the, the, basically, the, the quote goes like this. Can you quiet your mind and reference and become aware of your eternal self? Then it says, second question. Can you use your breath and your body to sustain uh, to, to su sustain the well-being of a newborn with no cares? In other words, can you coordinate? It's like the Qigong thing. Can you coordinate 
The first one's about the mind. The second one's about the body and the breath. And then the third one is, can you clear your inner vision until you see nothing but pure luminance? And so I thought to myself, I want to be a doctor of that. So then I went to Chinese medicine school, which took me to Hawaii, where I was introduced not only to Chinese medicine, and Chinese alchemy, and Tai Chi, and Qigong, but also living with the Hawaiian culture of uh, aloha and kahunas and, you know, all that stuff. So um, that's how I became a Chinese doctor. When I came back to Ohio, uh, there was a doctor, uh, an osteopath in, in Columbus, Ohio, who, who said, we always wanted to have a department of Chinese medicine, and I'm going to make you the, the the chief of the department of Chinese medicine. I just graduated from 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 Chinese medicine school like a couple of months ago. And I said, yes, of course. And it was absolutely fascinating. I, I should just say that doctor's name out loud because I have such reverence for him. That was Dr. Ernest Shearer, an osteopath, homeopath, amazing, amazing human being. But then due to family challenges and a, a, a marriage that wasn't going very well, I ended up moving to Santa Barbara. California, where I started my public Chinese medicine practice. But check this out, Paul. What happened next, and this is over a period of 20, I was like 35 years in the clinic. After about 20 years of being fascinated and, and you know, loving Chinese medicine, and I do love Chinese medicine. It's, it's, it's a very, very comprehensive, super powerful system. But I realized that the patients weren't getting it. The, the, my customers basically were treating me like a Western medical doctor. And they were saying, I'm not well. You're the expert. You fix me and I'll pay you. And what I was saying was, pay me to educate you so that I don't need to be your doctor. And instead of having a few patients that I charge a lot of money, I'll have a lot of patients that I ever only charge a little money because basically I was able to leverage them into self-awareness. And the percentage of the percentage of my patients who were actually taking the bait on that idea was like 15%. Yeah, it doesn't and surprise I me at all. I just said to myself, I don't want to do this anymore. So then uh, last little note was I retired my practice, and uh, in, in, in the meantime, I had been going to China many times, and um, I became the uh, director of the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi, where we have now trained over 2,000 uh, practice leaders and teachers, and the thing that we know about this, and I'm sure you'll relate, is that when we act as a when we act as a therapist, it is a part of the dynamic for the person to mistake the 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 context of being they don't know enough, and you're going to tell them what to do. And when I started teaching qigong, I realized now these are all people who believe that they can learn something and that they can leverage their own sovereign empowerment. And so rather than spending my time with 85% of people who weren't getting it, I was now spending my time with people who were 100% getting it. Well, you know, what, what that brings up for me is in, in particular is in my uh, Czech Institute education program, particularly my holistic lifestyle coaching program, myself and all the instructors tell the students, there's one thing you got to get clear on. We don't treat the disease that has the person. We coach the person that has acquired a disease. In other words, I tell people we don't work on a treatment model. In our culture, if I say Roger, I'm treating you for dinner. You automatically assume I'm paying. So when we 
don't realize that the word treatment means we're going to go somewhere and pay someone else to take care of our problems so that we can just get off the table and keep eating crap and not having a relationship with ourselves. then we really don't learn anything. And because we're not addressing the actual causative factors, nothing gets better. You just add toxicity and surgery to it and symptom alleviation, but you don't actually change the behavior. So what I teach is, is a coaching model. The whole Czech Institute's built on the concept that we coach people on how to live a healthy life and have a healthy relationship with their body, their mind, and their soul. And then they actually become aware of what I call the pain teacher. I say, whenever the pain teacher shows up in your life, it's a chance for awakening. It's a chance for deepening, deepening your education. It's an exploration. There's an offering being made to you at a spiritual level, at a mental level, at an emotional level, and a physical level to explore why the pain is there and what it means and how you're contributing to it, either because you have poor ergonomics, poor diet, you're working too much, you're not resting enough, you're maintaining unhealthy relationships or whatever it might be. Because if we don't coach people on how to deal with the factors that ultimately lead to ill health, poor energy and disease processes, no matter what we throw at them, they're, we're really just maintaining that pathological cycle and making it hurt less by by giving them palliative care. And as a therapist, I used to have to tell doctors all the time, I cannot have people on these heavy pain medications because I can't tell whether the exercises or the therapies I'm doing are hurting them or not. You know, So I was forever trying to get doctors permission to let people cut these doses back or come off the drugs to the point that they could handle the discomfort, but have a feedback loop for me. So, you know, my, I think my key point is that I built a whole institute based on a coaching model, and it's amazing how hard it is to get people out of the treatment model. I'll have people in their third and fourth year of training still asking, well, what should I give somebody for that? <laughs> you know, what pill should I take? So, so here's a kind of an interesting thing to come back with uh, ever so briefly, and it's a, uh, it's a revelation of the fact that we're like soul brothers. And that is that um, here at our organization, which is called Health Action Synergies, we have two departments. The first department is that we train mind-body practice leaders, and that's the Tai Chi and Qigong we just talked about. The other, uh, the other uh, deliverable is what we call the Circle of Life Coach Institute. And so we train people in life coaching, and I'm sure that our systems are, are very, very similar. And so it's kind of a, what we call it, we can say it's a confirmation. You and I are here in this discussion confirming that having these health practices both have a physiological and mental emotional component as well as a behavioral component. We call it holistic life planning. And, uh, you know, I think, what, what do you call your coaching system? Well, the Czech Institute basically now runs as an academy. So there's four years of training um, with mentors. So they take a block of training, then they work with mentors and they go apply it and they can, you know, do it for a living. So they're, they're actually in practice at the beginning, some of them wait till they're confident enough to start. So while they're doing their training, they're learning corrective exercise. So they're learning how to completely assess the musculoskeletal system, the nervous system. They're, and they're also going through holistic lifestyle coach training. So we have a parallel program, corrective and high performance exercise. So they know they master the science of orthopedic assessment designing exercise programs just to get people healthy. We have Qigong and Tai Chi included in the holistic lifestyle coaching practice. We have mental, emotional self-management tactics in there and strategies. We have a, a an underpinning non-denominational spiritual philosophy that's really based on the principles of 
universal creation. It has, you know, <laughs> a, a lot about the Tai Chi symbol, a lot about what quantum physics says about this, what mystics have taught us. So basically, while they're going through the training, they start off really learning to master the basics in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, while they're learning the science of how to apply exercise therapeutically for each individual's specific needs. There is no recipe programs at all in my institute, zero. It's all customized to the individual. And they also learn the science of developing uh, conditioning programs for elite athletes, for people that are serious competitive athletes. And so that's, that's four years. To do all my training takes most people about seven years because there's another branch called PPS Success Mastery Training, which looks at the 12 key things I found were the main obstructions to a person being healthy and living the life they want to live. So there's a lesson on how to address each of those 12 factors. And then there's the Check Four Quadrant Coaching Mastery, which goes very, very deep into the assessment of the psyche and what is it, what is a soul and what is spirit and how do these factors play out? What are archetypes? How do we deal with trauma from uh, our mother and our father and uh, <laughs> you know how do we deal with v being a victim and uh, a saboteur and a prostitute and um all good stuff man an, an eternal child and not accepting responsibility and moving into adulthood so it's it's quite comprehensive and it it's all the things in my career i found i had to look at in order to have a toolkit with enough um, versatility to address what is common uh, as the etiology of, of a human being's common uh, ailments. So I think that the Paul University and the Roger University are both, <clears throat> are both based on, this, on these beautiful principles that we've been uh, investigating together, Paul. Uh, what, what, what's next on our inquiry here? I'd like to know what the difference... Uh, it, but the, how would you describe the difference between Tai Chi and Qigong? Mm. Oh, yeah, that's a fun one. All right. So let's go to first the question of when did they arise? The practices among the Chinese tribes that uh, are what we call Qigong today would have been shamanic rituals. Um, while we perceive Qigong to be a health maximizing methodology and a personal empowerment methodology, the ancients would have declared that they didn't need a health maximizing methodology because they were eating the paleo diet and they were getting plenty of exercise, um, you know, hunting and doing whatever they do. Splitting firewood, all <laughs> sorts of stuff. Yeah, you all know. That, all that stuff. And, and so uh, we can say that Qigong has its roots in the origins of human intelligence at whatever point the human began to ask the question, who am I and where am I located? <laughs> yeah, uh, those are and, big questions. And, <laughs> yeah. And, of course, they, they developed this idea of the three treasures, which is gorgeous. And so I'll just tell you that the three treasures are, there are many versions of the three tre treasures. One version is body, mind, and spirit, classic uh, holistic ideal. Uh, the classic holistic ideal in Chinese uh, tribal, uh, original tribal terms is that there is a unknowable cosmological realm above us. We call that young. And below us, there is a measurable solid. We'll just call it the planet. And in between the planet and the sky, the boundless sky, not just the starry sky, but the wormhole sky, the black hole sky, the multiverse sky, uh, between the, the, the multiverse aspect of our being, which is eternal, and the uh, earth part of our being, which is uh, timed, basically timed relative to sun rising and setting and so forth, between those two lies a realm that we call uh, the biofield. And so 
the earth contributes to the biofield with um, a place to put down roots and a source of minerals. And the boundless sky is uh, the, uh, shall we say, infuses the biological self with, uh, with a um, intellect and spirit. And so those three treasures, in fact, that right there is a picture of, of, of that, and it's called uh, Tai Chi, not to confuse us because we're going to talk about Tai Chi in a moment. The point is that the earth and the sky come together to create a harmonious interaction between yin and yang. Another version of the three treasures is body adjustment, breath adjustment, mind adjustment. So that's Qigong. And the benefit of Qigong has to do with, uh, shall we say, developing a philosophy that liberates us from fear and reactiveness into a realm that we are allowed to cultivate where we are, shall we say, thoughtful, considerate, aware, and so forth. And notice, notice that I mentioned having a personal philosophy. Because if your personal philosophy is that things aren't working and I have to work harder, that's very different than if your philosophy says, things look weird, I better take better care of myself. And um, I'll compare the, uh, I'll make the final comparison of Qigong and Tai Chi in just a moment. So then Tai Chi is interesting because as a word in the Chinese language, the concept Tai Chi goes back to the beginning of language, and it basically means the things that we just talked about, the three treasures, the earth and the sky, duality as opposed to, to unity. If, if, if the quantum realm is a unified field, then what we're experiencing of the quantum realm is the dualistic field, which gives us a substantial self as well as a non-substantial self. And the substantial self and the, and the non-substantial self interact with each other to create, shall we say, a life. Yes, a so life, yeah. That whole concept of Tai Chi as the duality that creates the world that we perceive in a dimensional way did not get named. Uh, there was no physical practice that was named Tai Chi until around 1,600 AD, maybe 1,500 AD. So that's only 500 years ago. So origin of Qigong, ineffable, unknowable, timeless, back to the beginnings of, of uh, the shamanic era, whereas Tai Chi as a practice is actually, the name Tai Chi is applied to a physiological practice about 500 years ago. So that's a big difference. Just in time. So then let's talk about what we're actually doing when we do the practices. Qigong is very simple. Usually the gestures are bilateral, meaning that I'm using both hands to do the same thing. So I might uh, just do a little quick, super, super quick little practice that we can describe to people is that you turn your palms up in your lap and you breathe in and raise your hands to about the level of your chin. And then turn your palms down and exhale and lower your hands to about the level of your lap. Let's do it three times. Breathe in, raise your hands to the level of your chin. Turn your palms down, exhale, lower your hands to your lap. We'll just do it one more time. Long, slow breath in, raise your hands. Long, slow exhalation, lower your hands. So that's a that's an example of doing a breath practice and a movement practice all together, and both hands <clears throat> are doing the same thing. In Tai Chi, typically each hand does something different. And so that raises a degree of difficulty or several degrees of difficulty. So then what about the feet? In Qigong, typically the feet are you're either sitting or standing and your feet are staying in the same place. Whereas with Tai Chi, there's a stepping, an array of stepping gestures. 
So if we just look at those two things, Qigong gives you bilateral gestures with the hands and no gestures with the feet. And so you could say you could just relax and do that. Whereas with Tai Chi, the both feet are doing something different and both hands are doing something different. So that's by a magnitude of about four different things that the brain has to coordinate. And there's uh, there are other differences, but let's just leave it there for right now. And you can see the big difference of the two. So now what's the punchline and how are they different and how are they the same? How they're the same is that they're, 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 they're all based on three treasures. That the version of the three treasures that has the body, breath, and mind. So Qigong, Tai Chi, Yoga, they're all based on three treasures. So how are they different? If it's simple and it's slow, because if you take a deep breath and move with the breath, it's guaranteed to be a slower gesture because the breath is longer. So we're taking long, slow, deep breaths, which we know have an influence on the uh, vagal tone. We're also remembering gestures that are fairly simple, so we don't have to become hysterical and say, oh my gosh, I'm lost. And so we go deeper and deeper and deeper into self-reflection and uh, a kind of spacious internal focus. Whereas with Tai Chi, because the movements, and, and, and so let's just say the first one is very healing. It triggers the, uh, all of the features of the, uh, of the uh, parasympathetic nervous system, liberates all or activates all of these neurotransmitters, which are associated with uh, personal recovery and restoration. Whereas <clears throat> if you go to Tai Chi, there's a lot to remember. And you can do simple forms of Tai Chi. Actually, we've developed a form called Tai Chi Easy, but let's leave that aside for right now because tip, tr traditional Tai Chi is actually complex. You're moving the hands and the feet differently. You have to remember, like, well, wait a minute. But the other thing about how they're different is that Qigong repeats and Tai Chi tends to be sequential. So you have to remember all these different things that are going to happen next. And so the punchline is that Qigong soothes the autonomic, turns on the medicine within, and the Tai Chi is more like brain plasticity maximization, which is also a kind of internal medicine because we know that people who have high levels of brain plasticity are able to tolerate and accommodate all kinds of things that people who um, do not have uh, a high level of brain plasticity. So these two are actually, in a way, the same. And in another way, they are very different. So that if you have a Qigong and Tai Chi practice, you have a much more, uh, shall we say, comprehensive uh, array of influences on, on the mind and the body and, and even opening to spirit. And then we haven't really talked yet about Kung Fu and we haven't yet talked about any kind of, shall we say, um, cart, uh, uh, heavy cardiovascular type exercise, all of which are also, shall we say, useful. Hi, everybody. I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wait, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes Magnesium Breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combine them without any weird excipients or, you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people onto them. They buy them 
And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy by Optimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it and what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living 4D and put in your coupon code Paul10 and you get a 10% discount. And of course, everything has a 100% money back guarantee. You can't get better than that. And for a limited time, Bioptimizers is also giving away free bottles of their best-selling products, P3OM and Masszymes, with select purchases. Enjoy. What are some of the key, well, we've talked about a lot of the benefits, but what do you feel the minimum time commitment to a daily practice is to get noticeable results? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question because there are two answers. The first answer is the more cultivated, and we use the word cultivated to mean the more a person has a sustainable practice that is, shall we say, not just going to a class, not just having somebody else tell you what to do. Yeah, I'm speaking of of your own daily routine. Correct. So the point there is, the point that I was making is that if you're a cultivated person and you start your practice when you wake up in the morning, as we discussed earlier, and then you sustain the practice uh, throughout your day by being cultivated, meaning self-aware. Present. Yeah. Then the, yeah, and we like to call that presencing, which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the beautiful phrase. So if a person has the the self-awareness to be presencing throughout the day, and and key key here is, do you have a personal philosophy that liberates you from fear? So if you have a personal philosophy which liberates you from fear and you are self-aware throughout the day, then you can do your practice in a kind of homogenized in with everything else that you're doing. Whereas... If you're not that cultivated, then you need to do you need to set aside time. So if a person is going to do a practice that sets aside time, I would say at least 20 minutes, but people who are really into it will do, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 minutes. Whereas a person who's ultra cultivated, who is living a kind of paleolithic type life, like I live a very Paleolithic type life. There's a forest over there. I saw trees and I cut firewood and I uh, make pathways and I tend a place in the uh, <clears throat> in that natural environment as a practice, a place to practice, which is good, which is a highly compacted clay area, really cool birds and trees and all that. Plus, I've got a garden. Plus, I'm sort of rehabbing around the house. So I'm always working, doing physical work and having a Kung Fu practice and choosing great food like my wife Rebecca and I are, are doing celery juice in the morning these days and you know lots of lemon water and so forth. So I could say that for a cultivated person, you can just weave your practice into your debt. That's why when we go to the monastery and you say, well, why aren't these monks practicing? And the answer is, you know, why are the young monks doing Kung Fu? And why are these old monks just kind of wandering around? And the, the, uh, the answer is the older monks practiced like that when they were kids to be able to make contact with the capacity for s- sustained self-awareness. But then once they got to sustained self-awareness, now gardening, sweeping the courtyard, going for water, <clears throat> those all become Qigong practices. So there's two answers to the question. One is if you're going to have a discrete set of practice time, probably 20 minutes to 60 minutes, if you're cultivated enough to weave it into your life, then it's going to be woven into your life and probably even be more than 60 minutes. It's going to be there all the time and when you get bad news instead of panicking and freaking out what's going to happen is that you're going to get bad news and you're going to say to yourself got bad news how am i going to manage this so rather than being reactive we are 
deeply considerate, we're reflecting on a personal philosophy that liberates us from fear, and therefore we can kind of glide forward. You know, pe- people die, we glide forward. Eventually, I mean, even if we panic, we come back to glide. So why not just glide all the way? Yeah. I'd love it if you can give us a working definition of what chi is and how it moves through the body and and what does chi do that's unique? So chi is roughly equivalent to function of wherever it is. So the first thing about chi is that it's everywhere. So if we go to uh, through a dark uh, bl- uh, a, a black hole into a, another universe, then there's chi there, there's chi in the black hole, and there's chi over here. So then a planet has its chi, a sun has its chi, a tree has its chi, and a human has its chi. So how chi operates in the sun functionally is going to be how the sun works. But I think we're most interested in how can we make ourselves work better relative to the chi. So I'm just going to limit my comments now to that. Knowing the chi is everywhere, then what about within me? Well, I have chi of my brain, which is different than chi of my heart, which is different than chi of my liver, which is different than chi of my muscles, and so forth. And so the concept of chi within a human being has four levels of... um, and this is one of the things that I got to write about and, and, and loved studying up for in my book, which is called The Healing Promise of Chi, is uh, there's the physiological functional level. So that's going to be metabolism. That's an expression of chi. There's also the presence of um, ions in the body, ion exchanges, uh, the discharge of ions along the neurological pathway give you the experience of either moving your muscles or taking in a sensation like a pleasurable sensation or a painful sensation. So that ion conductance feature of the human being, you can call that internal electricity to a certain extent because that's what ions are. And then the the third one is that anywhere you have ions, by the definition of physics, there is a field. Yeah, electromagnetic and, field, at least electromagnetic. Correct. So we have metabolic function, we have ionic function, internal electricity, and then we have some kind of a, a electrical charge, which is uh, the magnetic field. And then the fourth level of chi in a human being and anywhere else in the world, there probably are four, but we're talking about people now is the quantum aspect, which is the eternal aspect, which has, that's where there is no center and there is no circumference. And we could call that the soul or the spirit, the aspect of the person, which takes on a body, but is not limited to that body in in the most essential ways. Right. So those are the four definitions for what chi is in humans And of course, how we maximize the chi is through all the things we've been saying, sleep, hydration, nutrition, physical exercise, meditation, all those, all that. Beautiful. Well, I love the, uh, you know, the practicality and the simplicity. My next question is a little different. uh, Traditional Chinese medicine is based on the principles of the five elements, earth, water, fire, wood, and metal and how these elements interact within nature. From my understanding, traditional Chinese medicine emerged from the study of nature by those living in nature. It seems quite apparent to me that humans in general and the mainstream uh, medicine practices in particular have lost connection with nature as we've been talking about and the natural principles which govern health, well-being, and our sense of connectedness. What I'd love is, what are your thoughts in this regard, and what tips can you offer people living in a modern world or a concrete jungle of a city for bringing some of these natural principles back into their lives again? Yeah, this is a troubling type question. I mean, it's (laughs) to talk about, of course, but I, I, it's interesting because I think of myself as a an optimist, 
and how I become, how I sustain my optimism is that I believe in timelessness and I believe that uh, in some way or another, <clears throat> we're all in the multiverse forever, whatever that might be. So in other words, we don't have to do anything particularly to be a winner because there's so much going on in so many dimensions beyond what we can even imagine. But, and we can talk more about that because it's actually, I think it's a favorite topic of, for both of us. Uh, but in a practical sense, <clears throat> I think that the first thing is that I would suggest and that has worked really well for me is to develop a personal philosophy that liberates me from the feeling that I'm wrong or that I've made a mistake or that the world is operating in a way that it shouldn't be operating. Because all of those put me into a state of panic and fear. And panic and fear <clears throat> are the enemy of the immune system. They're the enemy of sleep. They're, they're, they're the enemy of, 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 uh, of autonomic choices. balance. So like, if, for instance, if I go to the refrigerator or if anybody out there, you, when you go to the refrigerator, if you can ask yourself the question, why am I here? Am I here for nourishment or am I here to somehow transform the experience that I'm having by either dulling my functional capacity or, or you know, doping myself on sugar or something like that? So in other words, the point is, point one develop a personal philosophy that liberates you from guilt and fear and resentment. And, you know, what's the use of being resentful? I mean, the person that you're resenting is out there partying. What's the, <laughs> use, of, what's the use of not forgiving a person for the mistake that they made in their treatment of you? The, the answer is they don't care. They're on to the next thing. The person who's living with the lack of unforgiveness is me. And that that's a poison. And so first develop a, a methodology to be able to stop blaming yourself and move from because blame will also create procrastination, which is a, you know the death of your creativity. So the second thing that I would say suggestions have to do with uh, the, the whole concept of um, recovering a relationship with nature, even if you live in a place where you have to travel a ways to be able to get to it. Uh, because the presence of nature is awe-inspiring. And even if you go to a park that's not so very far from your house and just do some deep breathing practices while you're walking around in the park and maybe just take a moment to actually lean up against a tree and stop thinking about what you should be doing instead of what you are doing. Um, and those are the big ones. Uh, there's all, all the yang shang, right, which has to do with the nourishment, the sleep, the, you know, the, the, the Chinese have a whole thing about sexuality. We'll have to do an entire uh, meeting on that one. But let's just talk briefly about the five elements. The five elements are common to every culture. So we think, well, no, the Greeks only had four elements. Well, that's not true, because in the Greek tradition, the fifth element is ether. So uh, in the Chinese version, the fifth element is wood. Uh, <clears throat> so the fifth element is that which enlivens the other four elements, earth, water, fire, air, etc. And And ancient people found that they could develop a method for perceiving themselves in the world and for perceiving the world and the harmony of balance, harmony and balance of the aspects of ourself and the harmony and balance of the aspects of the world. Uh, we, in modern times, we don't do that. Um, basically, we've been uh, hypnotized into basically uh, consumers and um, what some people are calling meat 
robots, in other words, robots that basically act like robots, look like biological entities. And as you said earlier, transhumanism allows us to replace our physical parts with other parts. And it's a big, terrible mess. Uh, we can talk more about the five elements if you want to. But I think that the most for, in, in Chinese medicine, let me say this. In Chinese medicine, there are many systems for perceiving a human as a doctor. And one of those is the three treasures. We already talked about that. The, the second one is the yin and the yang. We've talked a little bit about that too. It's a little more complex. The, the next one is the five elements. After that, there's what's called the sixth division. After that, there's what's called the eight principles. After that, there's what's called the 12 ch uh, channels, the 12 uh, chi channels. Now, all of those methods are very powerful. Uh, and so the five elements is only one method for uh, clinically approaching an individual. I think that the three treasures method is the most powerful because of the fact that it's simple. Everybody knows they have a body. Everybody knows that they have a mind. And everybody speculates that they probably have a spiritual component to their being. And that is enough to be able to understand the concept of integration and harmonization. And so the average person can learn, uh, what can I do for my body to turn on the, the body elixir? What can I do for my mind and my emotions to turn on the mental emotional elixir? What can I do to open a space so that I am palpably infused with the presence of my eternal nature. That's a little harder, but it's, it's pretty easy to do. Back to you. Well, you know, uh, some of the things that, that I think are important, you know, I noticed right behind you, there's a beautiful plant. That's nature. And even if you live in a high rise building in Manhattan or uh, downtown Chicago, I find one of the things that's very helpful for people that I've prescribed to people many times is get a get some plants that really connect to you that you feel that that have the kind of presence and the beauty and one of the ways I help people realize this is I say have you ever moved into a house and it was just empty and then brought your trees and your plants in and noticed how different it felt or moved out of a house took all your plants and trees out and then stood in the house when it was empty and noticed it felt very dead, very empty, like a shell. I've never met a single person that didn't know the difference between how a house feels with and without plants and trees in it because they're living beings and they're rooted in the cosmos. They're rooted in the natural rhythms of the cosmos and they need affection. They need water. They need, and they respond to love and to care. And so there's a simple example of bringing nature into your environment. Everyone takes baths and showers. And so, you know, we've got this temperature controlled environment where people's autonomic nervous systems become very weak and their, their cardiovascular systems become weak because when we get cold, like taking a cold bath or a cold shower, initially you have vasodilation to bring water, blood to the surface to warm the body. But then as you get colder, you have vasoconstriction. So what happens is the entire arteriovascular tree is getting exercised, but most people have, you know, swollen ankles and stagnant fluids in their body because they're not actually engaging their autonomic nervous system and their arteriovascular tree. But out in nature, we would be cold in the winter and hot in the summer, and we would be taking baths and rivers and streams, and we would be working hard and sweating. So another aspect of nature is find something that you can do that's physical, that's practical, that uses functional movement patterns, like pick up a weighted object like a club bell and pretend you're chopping wood with it or shoveling snow with it. So we, we've also got sunlight and, and people can really take time to just be with the sun when it rises and do what what is called Egyptian sun gazing, where you just, in the first hour of sunlight and the last hour of sunlight, it's safe to look at the sun. And you can just empty yourself and let the sun enter you and harmonize yourself to the rhythms of the sun, because our whole 
hormonal system is driven by the sun. So I just threw a few things in there. I mean, all the things you said are very important for sure. And I, I, my concern is that so many people live in these sterile environments with no plant life and they don't realize the beauty and power of water or sunlight. The other thing is if you buy organic food, you're, you're bringing healthy soil and sunlight into your body without all the toxic chemicals. So you're actually connecting to the sun and the earth through the food, even if you do live in a high rise building. And these are very, very simple things that, that people are spending tons of money on Starbucks and alcohol and all sorts of shit, but it doesn't cost a lot of money to stand in the sun, have a few plants and really develop a relationship with the natural rhythms in life. It doesn't cost a lot of money to get your bare feet on some grass at a park and ground yourself. So those were just some of the things that, that were on my mind. And I think if we add the two of our comments together for literally pennies on the dollar, you can really change your whole life. Yeah, here's another one just briefly, and that is the moon. <clears throat> to, to actually have is something that you try to do in your life. You could just say to yourself, in my life, I am going to figure this out. And yes. then, uh, the question is, when is the moon full? You know, can I actually plan my life in such a way that I'll be able to see the full moon? Even if I have to leave a high rise and go and stand out in the street for a few minutes, just to be able to see like how the patterns of that moon in its constant changing, not only in its phases, but its its location in the sky from where it rises sometimes closer to the north and other times closer to the south. And then there's a, a full moon and, a, and then there's the uh, opposite, which is the uh, new moon. And to be able to actually, because the, uh, the uh, ancient people saw, unless the, except for weather, they saw every full moon, every new moon, they asked themselves the question, you know, I wonder how many days it is to the full moon. And a person can, by watching the moon over a, over a number of months and years, can actually start to project, I think the full moon is going to be about seven days from now. And it's a whole exercise in connecting with the local cosmology and translating that into our, shall we say, our embodiment. Yes, and, and, and with that cosmology comes the rhythms and drives of nature. So, you know, we all know what lunacy is. Full moon <laughs> energy is sunlight in reverse, and it's quite stressful. Steiner describes how full moon light is very stressful to plants, but the stress makes them grow. It makes them stronger. Stronger. Yeah, yeah. That, and by the way, that's, that, you probably know this term, but we'll put it in here, homeostatic stress. In other words, the capacity to leave the center of, of homeostasis, get too cold or get too hot, but then recover. To exercise to the point that you're breathing quickly, and then how quickly can you come back? How quickly can your heart rate come back? What happens when you turn the cold water on? Do you feel like it's something that you're used to and you can recover from immediately? Or do you say, oh, panic, panic, I can't stand in cold water? All that is a kind of resiliency maximization, and, and none of it has a cost. No. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story about the moon. I think the listeners might find it interesting, too. I build water chargers out of stone. So long story made short, I alternate polarities of stone from crystal and very yang to things like black lava and very yin stones, which produces an, a, a bioelectrical charge. And I make these things that are like giant cones. So they actually create a vortex, which you, you can feel it very strongly, especially if you stand inside the water charger. I have one I built here. It took me three months to build. It'll hold about 70 bottles, three gallon glass bottles of water. But it's I can do chanting and toning in there. You could even do Tai Chi in it. It's big enough for that. <laughs> but years ago, when I my soul guided me to start working with stones again, my soul told me to build a water charger and guided me to exactly what to do. And then I remember I started paying attention 
each time I opened a new bottle to how the water tasted and how it felt in my body. And I could feel that each time I opened the bottle, there was something different. Either the energy was more expansive or it was more, the water was more empty. But every now and then I would pull a bottle out. Now these glass bottles are sitting on the ground are very thick, heavy glass bottles. I would take a drink and every now and then it would taste just like dirt. And other times it would taste metallic like metal. And I'm like, well, there's no way this dirt's getting through these glass bottles. And I was like, how is this happening? <laughs> and I said to my soul, what is making this change in the water? And my soul just tipped my head right up. It was, I was outside. It was dark and the moon was out. And my eyes went right to the moon. I said, it's the moon. And my soul said, get a moon calendar and watch what's happening in the water. So I bought a moon calendar. And on the full moon, sometimes the water has so much energy, it literally bubbles in your mouth like carbonated water. And on the new moon, it's so empty. It's like a solvent. When you drink, it feels like it's going to go right through your tongue. So I started experimenting and found that new moon water is very good for detoxification, but full moon water is very good for energization. But if somebody's, for example, already drinking too much coffee, new moon water is overstimulating. They, I mean, oh, a full moon water is too stimulating. It's too yang. And new moon water is better for them. But if somebody's in a depressive state, full moon water will lift them up. So I started really developing this relationship with the moon. And it was just, it's just unbelievable how much of an influence it's having on every single thing that has water in it on this planet, which is pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah. And the difference between my corn last year and my corn this year is almost guaranteed to be that I planted last year on the perfect moon moment and this this year I did not because the the plants are just completely different they're in the same place they got the same compost same length of day everything and it was just probably and I didn't even notice unfortunately the phase of the moon that I planted them in yeah steiner steiner's uh, biodynamic farming system just in case you're interested, if you look into biodynamic farming, they give you exactly the right phase of the moon to plant all sorts of different plants. So you optimize because each of the seeds is tuned to the moon and respond better at different times. Yeah, so, I'm familiar. Actually, my kids, my kids went to Waldorf school. Oh, great. Yeah, mine do too. It's fantastic. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony and... You're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Shervin Jaffaria, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Shilaj minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their biocharge activated coconut charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis liposomal glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. My next question is this. My, my personal Tai Chi master was Master Fong Ha from San Francisco. And he put me on a series of gong practices that had a very profound effect on me on many levels, including strengthening my voyances to quite an extraordinary degree. Now, I'm sure you know, of course, because you're a master at this, that a gong is a 100-day commitment. So I'm wondering if you could explain why a gong commitment practice is used by so many masters. Why do they ask you to do a 100-day consecutive process? as a gong. <clears throat> now, of course, I know the answers to this, but I want to hear your take on it. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of answers to this. And one of them is that a um, hundred isn't actually the number. 
Oh, is it? That's what I was taught. <clears throat> the number is 99. Oh, I didn't know that. Fong Ha taught me 100. <laughs> yeah, well, here's the here's how that happened, is that the, pow- the big power number in the Chinese tribes is the number nine. And it has uh, been sort of borne out by the Tesla. Yeah, uh, three, six, nine, yeah. Exactly. And so the... Um, so, you know, 99 is easy to round to 100. And most Chinese people realize that if you tell Caucasians, you got to do this 99 times, they'll say, well, what's wrong with you? Why not 100? So they just they just round it up to, to eliminate the need for that particular discussion because it's only just one day. So then the power of, of the concept of having a sustained practice for, shall we say, uh, about three months, is that um, the first month is very different than the second month, and the third month is very different than the second month. And some teachers will say it can be cumulative. So in other words, if you start on one day and then you miss a day, then you just don't count that day. And when you get to 100, that's that. Others are a little bit more, shall we say, uh, fascistic about this. And if you skip a day, then you have to start over. I'm one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I have reasons. <laughs> so, you know, in my particular point of view, what I'm, I, I, I feel it's important for people to discover the power of discipline on their own, as opposed to having that be imposed on them by, you know, a, of, of, of an authoritarian resource. So the, the, the difference, just very subtly, and you can maybe speak to this briefly, is that the first month of a gong, or a gong basically means work. Qi means, you know, transcendental life force infused everywhere in the universe. Gong means working with the qi within your own domain which isn't just within your own being, but also in your relationships and even in your career and your relationship with nature and so forth. And so to to have a a 99 or 100 day gong means that you will have gone through the part where you think to yourself, you know, why am I doing this? This isn't that much fun. The second um, month is kind of like if you get there or when you get there, it's somewhere around the whole idea of, oh, I think I'm kind of getting it. This is really making sense as I dis- as I bring myself into presence um, on a regular basis. I realize there's something in presence. A lot of people will tell you, I I, I got to presence and I I couldn't do it. I was just too distracted. So there's something about um, evolving from why would I even do this presencing thing to wow, there's really some power and presence. And then the third month, or the third 30 plus days, 33 days, and by the way, three times three is nine, right? So we're back to nine again. So that that third month is uh, not, I'm questioning why I'm doing this, but I'll do it anyway. Or And it's not even, wow, this seems like it has value, but now I'm deepening into that value. And it's so compelling that everything that used to compel me is no longer compelling me because this is more compelling than all of that. Yeah, I like that. You see, the reason I use gongs with my students and my patients is because one of the most common things I see as a therapist is that people don't have the discipline to make the changes that they need to make to heal. And so I have a gong sheet that I made up and I have different practices that I give them. And I choose the practice based on what I perceive that they need and what their personality is. So for somebody who's very yang and buzzy, I don't give them a slow dull movement. I give them something with a little more um, energy to it as an initial practice. But then I have them fill out the gong sheet. And then when they come back to me, I tell them, bring your gong sheet whenever you come for your therapy sessions. And then when they say things like, well, you know, I'm still having this problem, my guts, this, my 
and I look at their diet log and I see that they're still eating sugar and they're still eating gluten and they're still eating junk food. And then I say, how's your Tai Chi chi going? And they say, oh, you to be honest with you, I don't feel much. And I go, let me see your gong sheet. (laughs) And then what I, and whenever they skip a day, they just leave it blank or put a dash in it. And when they do the day, they check mark it. And so I look at the gong sheet and I say, I see, look, check, dash, 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 check, dash, check, dash, 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 dash. And I say, now what I want you to do is look at that sheet and pretend that that's somebody you love. And then ask yourself, am I committed to this relationship or am I just dabbling in it and hoping that by dabbling, I'm actually going to become a healthier, more vital, more clear person. And so I use the gong sheet as a mirror to show them what their own commitment to their healing is or to creating their dream is or to their healing. And it, I found it very, very effective because if they don't have a dream, you know, I like to quote Jerry Wesh as a psychologist. He says, if you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis. So when I see that people are not committing to their dream of getting healthier, whatever their stated dream is, putting on some muscle, being able to get over their back pain or play with their grandkids. I also ask them, do we have the right dream for you? Because maybe you're not committed enough to this dream. Is there something that's even more important to you than getting rid of your back pain or whatever your stated dream is? And sometimes I have to go through a qualification process to say, let's really look at your dream because it doesn't seem like you're that drawn to it. You're you're not really willing to stop doing the things that got you in trouble in the first place. And remember, I always say if you if you aren't sure what your dream is, then let's focus on what your nightmare is, because that's where the most energy is tied up. That's where the most vitality is being tied up. So sometimes I switch to making healing the nightmare the dream. But all this is just to say that for me, after having spent time being trained by Fong Ha and having phenomenal experiences, I did Tai Chi daily for 18 years, usually between 20 minutes and an hour and a half, sometimes twice a day. And I found it was so profound and mind blowing. It was just like, I would say beyond religion. It took me in to every, I've been deep into no mind and complete loss of identity and places that uh, I've only been able to uh, try to get to through the use of plant medicines. But because I was able to get there so deeply through Tai Chi, I was able to take these journeys on plant medicines and correlate the two and say, ah, yes, I've been here before. I, I know, you know, I know this experience. It's not a shock to me, you know? And so I think that one of the things that it's important for people in our culture where everybody's looking for instant gratification is to make a commitment to yourself. And I did a blog post one time. I think you'll find this interesting. I did a video blog called what I learned from a bucket. And at my old office, which was a beautiful house on top of a mountain, the tap outside where I would water the plants, the valve was worn out and the landlord was just dragging his feet for a couple of years to fix it. But I would put a, 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 a big, huge watering can underneath it. And I would be shocked. I would come out there. It was just dripping like once every four seconds. I'd come out there. I'd put it up there in the morning. I'd come out in the evening. There was like half a gallon of water in there. Then I'd come out the next day and there's a gallon of water in there. I'm like, wow, this like one drop every four seconds adds up to a lot of water. So I I sort of looked at this thing and I said, ah, there's the gong practice. If we just get one drop more chi and rise ourselves up one drop, eventually all of a sudden we have enough to water the garden or do something with and we because we're going beyond just our survival needs. Now we have enough life force in us to be creative and to solve problems and to, to really contribute to life instead of just surviving it you know so that was my little what i learned from a bucket story i like that (laughs) yeah thank you um in the this is one that i think's phenomenal right here in the preface to your book the healer within you had a very potent quote from thomas jefferson which i want to talk to you about 
He said, when the people are even mildly enlightened, oppression of the body and mind will disappear. Now, from a president of the United States, that's a very potent, deep comment. uh, And it's something I completely agree with, but it brings up a question that I get asked a lot, and I want to hear what your thoughts are. And that is, I get asked all the time, what is enlightenment? Because he's using a word that hardly anybody understands. What's your conception of enlightenment? Yeah, wow, wow. That, 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 that's beautiful. Thank you for asking that question. And, you know, we all have a little bit of a struggle these days with, <clears throat> with our good friend Thomas Jefferson, given the fact that he had such a multiplicity of, uh, shall we say, vectors of uh, social economic uh, influence. Um, but uh, I really like his Declaration of Independence. And I think that that whole thing about um, inalienable rights to, uh, you know, health, basically, because how can you be happy if you're not healthy? So, um, so the concept of enlightenment goes to so many different directions. So first, we'll talk about light and photons. And we talked earlier about getting enough exposure to the sun. So I think about being enlightened as a body has to do with being exposed to the the heavenly lights, sun and the moon and so forth. We've discussed that. The second thing about light, and it's interesting, there's a lot of words uh, that have two definitions, like, for instance, the word feeling. Uh, I, I have a sensory feeling, but I also have an emotional feeling, and we use feeling for both of those. And the we use light in many ways, and one of them, uh, other than photons, has to do with weight. And so earlier I said, and I, I, I'm pretty sure you probably are a fan of an idea similar to this, is that the first thing that people can do to um, maximize their potential is to give themselves the freedom to have an, a personal philosophy <clears throat> that liberates them from default uh, behaviors that are basically reactions, which are basically based on early life trauma or even karmic trauma. And so how do we get a hold of ourselves? And the answer is to let go. And in Qigong, we have a, a phrase that is very, very often used in Qigong called Fang Song. Fang Song means not only relax, but it means let go. So when you say relax your mind, it's it's more descriptive to say let go of what is in your mind. When you say relax, it's for the body. When you say let go, it's for wh- what are you holding on to that distracts you from the experience of personal liberation and freedom in the moment. And so enlightenment means letting go of weights that we carry. And of course, the lighter we are, the more liberated we are, and the more free uh, easily we can navigate between the two worlds, right? We've got the underworld, we've got the upper world, and we're in the middle world. How are we going to navigate in the middle world? Well, balance and harmony of our relationship between our transcendental self and our physiological self <clears throat> is going to have to do with mind focus and sustainable awareness so I can make a choice that has to do with my dimensional self and say, like, I need 10 bucks, I'm going to go get it somewhere. And then I can make a choice to my more absolute or transcendental self, which says, I don't need 10 bucks, and I'm not going anywhere. And then how do we put those together so that we're navigating to the dimensional life at occasionally or frequently because we're in dimension and then how can I get into the non or trans dimensional self when it comes time to do that? And, and, you know, you can't have somebody tell you, this is how you do that. You can only tell a person the things that you tell a person, you know, discipline is going to help. You need a plan. You can change the plan anytime you want to getting down on yourself when you make a goal and then don't fulfill it is just a waste of time because that's a 
whole bunch of wisdom you just gained. Reset your goal, move forward, keep moving, except when it's time to rest, then really slow down. So that's the definition of enlightenment that has to do with carrying weight. And then there's something in our, um, uh, our culture where we talk about light, meaning the presence of the transcendental self. So when I'm enlightened, I am more sustainably associated with the aspect of myself, which here's my probably one of my favorite phrases, with the aspect of myself, which is eternally well, cannot get sick, and does not die. What can I do to get into a relationship with the part of myself which is eternally well? Well, what you know, when a person is sick, you'd say, Well, how can you say that? And the answer is, I can say that because there's a part of you that's well that you're not in touch with. It doesn't mean you're gonna get better. It doesn't mean you're gonna get better just because you made contact with your transcendental self. I mean, your transcendental self could be driving this thing right into the tunnel of light. So, so the point that I'm making here is that there's a lot of ways that we describe light. And I think that they're all in the word enlightenment. That, that word has all of those in it. Yeah. I, I agree with all that. I, I think for me, enlightenment is, is one, it's never ending. Um, it's a, it's an ongoing process, no matter who you are. Um, but I really think from my own experience in my life that enlightenment has a lot to do with the realization of who and what you really are. You know, like we talked about the moon. Well, the moon's changing you every day. You are the moon, the, the quality of the soil and the air. And the water that comes into you has a huge influence on your experience of being you, but it helps you realize, wait a minute, my experience inside of myself can change radically depending on my relationship with sunlight, with food, the quality of the soil that it comes from, where the moon is at. So I must not really just be a fully self-contained thing. I'm actually porous to the entire universe. So through these basic observations, a person's sense of self begins to expand. And so Yogananda called this self-realization with a capital S. Jung referred to the self as that which sustains and supports you, which is the earth and, and all these things we're talking about. So for me, in a lot of ways, to be enlightened means to be aware that you are all of it and it's all in you. It's all around you. And if you segregate yourself from that, then you're living in ways that actually lead to a confined experience, which leads a lot of people into a sense of anxiety because they can't figure out why they're here or what's it all for, you know? But when you realize that the universe is breathing you and the universe is creating through you and having an experience through you and that you're it and it's you. Then all of a sudden, borders, barriers, race, color, ethnic, religious differences become not something uh, to fight against. They become like an artist that has a lot of colors that they can paint with. And the artist that's painting us is each of us is like a color or a, a different uh, instrument in the orchestra. And then you can look at life and see, wow, it is amazingly complex and beautiful. And so when someone reaches that point of authentic realization, I think that's really what one form of enlightenment. So you, you, because you begin to realize that how you care for the environment affects you directly, how you relate to these three worlds that we're talking about affects you very directly. If you only see yourself as this physical thing, then you're going to come face to face with this fear of death. And you have this big, huge question, what happens when I die? But if you spend time doing the kind of practices you and I have spent a lot of our life doing, you've, my thought is, well, when I die, guess what, man? I'm going to go party. I'm going to dance around all these stars. I'm going to go visit all my other friends. And I, 
And I know they're there because I visit them from here because I'm not stuck here. I can take you and meet people on the sun, on Venus, wherever you want to go. <laughs> the place is loaded, you know, so it's like a big old party. But to, <laughs> well, to me, uh, yeah, Paul, go ahead. We just wrote, I think we just wrote the book between you and me. We just wrote the book on, on enlightenment. <laughs> Good. I hope everybody else was happy to hear the audiobook <laughs> version and, and, and that they engage it. And, and this is another thing. That's why I was talking about like caring for a plant. When you see how plants respond to your love, I'll tell you a, a funny story about that. Some of my instructors used to think I was nuts because, you know, I'm into all this stuff and, and they often would come to me because they wanted to be a badass conditioning coach for a professional sports team. But they quickly find out that Paul is not just about lifting weights. And one of my instructors who had worked with me for several years, she actually Im uh, immigrated from New Zealand to work with me. Uh, and she worked with me for five years every day in my clinic. Well, I have a very intimate relationship with my plants. I love them. I talk to them. I stroke them. I love watering them and having a real relationship with them. And she was in my office one day when I was kind of cuddling up to my mama plant, which is right over there, who's a very powerful healer. And uh, she said, Paul, why do you talk to plants like that? You know, they're just plants. They don't hear you. I said, oh, is that right? I said, watch this. So I took my fingertip and I put it about a quarter of an inch from the leaf. And I said, Mama, because I call her Mama, I said, Mama, would you please touch my finger so Susie can see that you're really alive? And the plant dropped its leaf down and touched my finger. And she <laughs> goes, she goes, oh, my God, I think you're just playing a trick on me. You moved your hand. I said, here, you hold my hand. I let her hold my hand. I said, Mama, show Susie that you're alive and that you're listening to me. And she dropped down and touched my finger. And then when Susie tried it, she wouldn't do it. She, was, she, she had too much doubt and too much fear, like too much insecurity. So she goes, do it again. So I did it several times for her. But she realized that the plant was alive and it was listening and it can move. I said, of course it can move. Haven't you noticed if you put a flower in the windowsill, it'll follow the sun? It's always moving. And so I taught her the electrophysiology of how a plant works and everything. But anyhow, I, I just wanted to share that funny little story. That's a good one. Now, continuing on with Jefferson's quote, again, when the people are even mildly enlightened, depression of the body and mind will disappear. We're in a very dangerous situation worldwide today with the imposition of a materialist corporate kind of uh, scientocracy. Our freedom to choose what we will allow within our own bodies is fast being taken away. I've spent about 600 hours studying the whole issue behind everything going on. And I've seen documents from within the corporations, from within the circles of the ruling elite. And I've even seen documents within these corporations that are actually published and out there for others to read, where they're referring to the public as rats and sheep that they feel they must control to ultimately eliminate uh, basically us and do what they call the Great Reset. So reflecting back on Jefferson's quote, it seems a large segment of the population is dangerously unconscious. unconscious and oppression of the body and mind are at an all-time high. I'd love to hear uh, from your perspective and from your own living wisdom what you feel has led us into this situation and what your uh, suggestions are for gaining sovereignty over our bodies, restoring our constitutional freedoms, and bringing some balance back into the world. Yeah, so big, 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 big topic there. So um, well, You're a deep guy. Yeah, so so here here's uh, I don't know if this is uh, well I'll just go with it because you know one of the things that I keep saying is develop a personal philosophy that liberates you from constraint and and so in developing my personal philosophy so I I, I want to say that this is just for me and uh, anybody else can sort of uh, noodle on it and see what they feel like. So, first of all, I, I don't believe in the universe. I believe in the multiverse. Yeah. And you, you can't do the math on the nature of the world um, if you don't have more than one universe. And, you know, what's a black hole anyway and all that stuff. So, <clears throat> um, 
within that construct, I ask myself, when I die, if I have good or bad karma, whatever that might be, where will I take birth? And, and the answer is the least likely place for me to take birth ever again would be the planet Earth. So I'm just here for this one time, it's personal view, and um, I'm very interested in my next incarnation, which could easily be uh, not in any human form at all, could be an energetic uh, you know, entity um, in, a, uh, in a timeless uh, place without sun rising and falling. I have no idea. I don't care. I think it'll be absolutely fascinating, just like this life is absolutely fascinating. So in that context, if I ask the question, why is the world doing what it is? And how do I feel about that? I have two, two ways of answering it. I can answer it as a socio-political being. Uh, who's navigating the you know the streets where I live and the the, the clock that I live by, uh, or I can answer that same question from the perspective of not really caring too much, because there's probably another place in the universe that's almost like this one. Call it the multi multiple worlds theory. Yeah, I'm very familiar with it. And one of the things we can say, and I love to say this line, so I'll say it to you right now, is if, <clears throat> imagine, if everything that you can bring to mind, everything that you can imagine, plus everything that you cannot imagine, is all happening now. So that is a mind-blowing sort of, you know, and anybody who's listening to that, just, you know, push a pause button, rewind 30 seconds, and listen to that again, and think to yourself, if I'm in a domain where one of absolutely everything that I could and can't imagine is happening, then I can also imagine that I'm having all kinds of other experiences in other dimensions now, too. And I can't solve the problem of you know, how is it that I'm more conscious of this dimension and, you know, what happens in dreams? And, you know, like I have some ideas about that, but let's don't linger there. So then the question becomes, how do you feel about what's going on in the world today? And for me, based on my own personal philosophy, which liberates me from the idea of having to feel guilt and shame and responsibility and regret that, that just weigh me down and make me sick. But to be just free of that and be as creative as possible going forward, I'm going to say I'm entertained. I'm entertained by what's going on because I know that on another stage in another set of dimensions, I'm experiencing another type of entertainment. And if it's not entertainment, then what is it? Well, it's like work or, or it's scary or it's non-definable and, and I, if it's not defined and I can't control it then I'm panicking and I don't I'm committed to the best of my ability to developing my own philosophy and having freedom from all of those weights <clears throat> and in that context I am to some extent I must admit I, I feel a feeling like, you know, when soldiers survive a situation, well, the people that they knew really well did not and have a kind of regret for the fact that they were not killed themselves. <clears throat> I have that feeling. So when I listen to, and I won't mention anything uh, that's necessarily um, in this particular time on the calendar, because there's always something going on that's some kind of a big problem, and sometimes it gets worse, and then sometimes we have ages of enlightenment, like 1967. <laughs> 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 the, summer, the summer of love. That yeah, I... Lucy, in, Lucy in the sky with diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> so the point here is that for me, while I am interested in what's going on, I'm not really aligned with 
what anybody would call a side. And then when it comes to all the people who are kind of like not aligned to those sides, which is a kind of political duality, <clears throat> I know that there are more people that are in between, and I don't mean that they are centrists. So I'm not talking about conservative centricity or liberal centricity. I'm talking about the big tribe of the human race and what they care about. And what people care about is well-being, family, creativity, and all this stuff that happens in the extremes with these what they call parties, which I think are you know, super party poopers myself, is um, that non-believing in those. So, so then let's take it to the the ripoff of the military industrial complex or the medical industrial complex. So you might say, well, okay, then you're so active in in fighting the military industrial complex and the um, and the uh, medical industrial complex. And I would tell you that I do that because that's what I do. Yeah. It's not because I have a feeling about something that should or shouldn't be happening or some kind of feeling of responsibility that I feel I have to do this to be able to get into heaven or whatever. It's because it's the essence of my being. Yeah. And I don't have to have anything beyond that to say, I want to support everything about regeneration that there is going on right now. So I don't do it because I think it's right. I do it because I think it's that's what I do. Yeah, I understand that. I know a lot of people listening are going to have a really hard time wrapping their heads around that philosophy because you have to have reached a certain level of spiritual maturity to really get that. Um, it's it's um it's a good a, a good example of that is many of those patients and students I've had over the years will come to me and say, "What is this concept of no mind? Why would anybody want to have no mind?" But people like you and I know, hey man, magic happens when there's no <laughs> mind because what that really means is that your program mind isn't there and the whole universe is working through you and it's pretty effortless and magical. But they you see our culture thinks no mind means you're a zombie or you're dead or something. Right, 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 right. right. But here, right, right. Let me say this right here because I want to credit you and your questions and so forth for getting us right to this moment. So when a person is saying, why would you want to have no mind? then you and I could easily go right down the list of benefits. And the first benefit of having no mind is the fact that the autonomic nervous system will tend to sit at a level of, Balance. Uh, shall we say, uh, maximized uh, homeostatic capacity. And at the level of having maximized and sustainable home homeostatic capacity, we're producing all the medicine that we would need to be able to cure this body without going anywhere, without getting a diagnosis, without needing any sort of uh, dealing with any sort of side effects, that just the simple act of being on purpose in a sustained presencing sort of way, which I know that you and I are cultivating is probably more than most people, is absolutely compelling. And the, the big thing that is hard for people to understand, you know, you get to that whenever you do. But the thing that comes under that, which is really practical, is freedom from pain, freedom from shame, a, a and, and just an, uh, an upwelling of creativity and self-acceptance and the, the capacity to na to navigate the days and the weeks of our lives and the relationships in our lives is always going to be more, I'm going to say, mo' better if we are cultivated. And so the question really becomes, I mean, you asked me the question, you know, how do I feel and what do I do and where are you located and all of this? And I, and I told you and you said that people would have a hard time with that. What we're trying to do now is bring that down to, well, what is the practical thing that I'm going to get out of? 
So the first one is you're going to be more vital. Then we could also talk about, and I'll bet you're happy to do it, and we can do it briefly and go on to the next thing. But what happens when we're not judging ourselves as incomplete or unable or whatever? Well, creativity arises, and then procrastination reduces in the presence of the what I would call the more fully expressed spiritual essence, which arises from this whole thing that's kind of hard to understand, but that has the very practical aspect of reducing pain and maximizing personal energy. Yes. Hi, everybody. You know, people from around the world are constantly asking me where they can find organic foods and supplements that are actually organic, not just some fake impersonation, which is sadly so common in the marketplace today. My most common suggestion is go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, where you can find a wide range of excellent nutritious products made from certified organic source materials. Organifi has superfood drinks that actually taste great, (laughs) unlike most, immune support products, excellent high-quality protein powders, digestive support, joint support, liver support, green juice, hormonal support, and menstrual ease nutrition formulated by a team of female herbologists for women and more. My family and I and a significant number of my clients and friends and students from around the world use and love Organifi products because they're nutritious, taste great, And unlike many products, you actually get what you pay for. Hallelujah. I love Organifi's high values and high quality products, and they're excellent for athletes, children, and the whole family. There's no better investment than investing in your own health and well-being. And when it comes to investing in my health and the health of my family, I go to Organifi. If that's not enough to make you want to explore all the amazing products waiting for you at Organifi, I'd love to sweeten the deal for you by offering you a special Living 4D with Paul Check discount of 20% on any of Organifi's excellent certified organic super clean nutritious products by using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20 on checkout. That's CHECK20, all caps, on checkout. I hope you enjoy Organifi as much as my family and I do. My next question, instead of saying what I think, I'll go to my next question because it really holds the key to why more of us aren't living that way. So my next question is, Confucius was a masterful teacher and developed an incredibly well-rounded system of education for the Chinese people in his era. His teachings and principles of gaining a a well-rounded education were vastly different from those we use in the Western world. That said, it's easy to see that Chinese people have fallen dangerously into the trap of mechanization, automation, consumption of processed foods, and many other American nightmares. I personally feel that the global situation we're in links back to the fact that our education system in general is broken and not designed to educate, but to indoctrinate. In fact, religion has been a system of education for indoctrination for a very long time. So, Dr. Janke, Janka, what are your (laughs) thoughts? Sorry, what are your thoughts on the link between education, the challenges to our body, mind, health, and the situation we're in at this time? Yeah, well, I love this question, and and we can refer just briefly to a book that I'm pretty sure that you've read. It's called Sapiens, and Sapiens is this story about the history of the evolution of the human race and so forth, and. One of the things that it refers to is the fact that ancient people who were nomadic previous to agriculture had a different kind of a brain that was directly associated with the sun and the moon and all the stuff we've been talking about. And so the kind of education that arises from um, <clears throat> piling up stones to make a statue and um, planting a garden, but not only having a garden, but also having a relationship with plants that aren't in the garden, the ones that are indigenous to the region and, and the, all the different levels of that, because those plants that are not in the garden were the plants that the Paleolithic people in our community were eating. That's what we call paleo. And so to have a relationship with those plants 
and uh, and the moon <clears throat> and the the uh, migrations of uh, nomadic type people previous to agriculture, there apparently is a mountain of research on the fact that that quality of a brain has the shall we say the capacity to um, to sustain itself in um, a ver- directly in a relationship with nature, whereas the capacity of our current brain is such that if 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 um, technology and electricity and water flow and everything shut down, most people are going to first of all panic and then they're going to die. Yeah. And the people who have some of this paleo brain, which we can cultivate through gardening and hiking and and doing breath practices and having a garden and so forth gives us a, a kind of resiliency and sustainability that is impossible, right? Okay, so now let's go to education. As you said, education is indoctrination. And, uh, and, and of course, what we do is we build big, faster, better ways to make human beings into consumers, so the the human being actually becomes the engine of the consumption <laughs> world, uh, sociological economic you know complex and so uh, you know I, I would actually go past Confucius to Lao Tzu for for education if we go to Lao Tzu for education it's all about nature if you go to Confucius for education what happens is that you're going to court culture because uh, uh, Confucius was really talking to mis- the ministerial court, whereas uh, da- Lao Tzu was talking to everybody because uh, everybody is inherently an expression of the natural world and, you know, et cetera and so forth. So in the final analysis, our current education, and that's why my kids go to a Waldorf, went to a Waldorf school. That's why your kids are in a Waldorf school. That's why we love Rudolf Steiner and, you know, Edgar Casey and theosophy and Native American shaman and, you know, all that stuff is that we understand the value of exposing people to nature as a way to be able to learn about everything, mathematics, chemistry, geometry, geometry relationships. Yeah, all of it. So um, the, the last thing I'll say about that is that, again, for me, I'm an older person, you know, I've got a lot of experience. I'm looking at the tunnel of light, you know, it's coming my way. And um, I, I don't have that feeling of, uh, of uh, well, I have the feeling of immortality, but I don't have the feeling of wanting to or being able to stay in these dimensions for longer than I do. And, and I don't really care about that because there's no time anyway. So back to you. Well, I'll just loop back a, a touch. The reason I mentioned Confucius, not Lao Tzu, is because having studied a lot of Lao Tzu, his philosophy is so deep that unless you were raised by parents that were steeped in that tradition, it would be very, very hard for the most people to sit with Lao Tzu and really understand what in the hell he's talking about, at <laughs> least from, from our culture. Uh, now, I, when I first read the Tao Te Ching, I got to tell you what happened to me. I went, what the hell happened to Western religion? This guy did it in 81 verses of poetry. It tells the truth of life in the universe. It teaches you how to live. And there's no extra words. And why are we not learning this in school? Amen. So that was my first reaction. I'm like, I was like, oh my God, people think the Chinese are backwards and outdated and all this stuff. They haven't read this. And I, I've actually probably read that book and listened to it at least 15 times. I probably have 15 or 20 different um, translations of it. Yep, and every time, every single time I pick it up, I learn something from it. I'm like, damn, this thing's got no bottom to it. But <laughs> the reason I chose Confucius is because what he did was, yes, he built, shall we say, a classic education system. But he taught art, he taught calligraphy, he taught poetry, 
He made well-rounded people. We've got people coming out of our education systems with PhDs and master's degrees and bachelor's degrees and high school diplomas that are so out of balance that they're like math focused or they're this focused and and they're they're like one pronged tools. You know, there's the old saying, if all you got in your pocket is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But to somebody that knows how to use 50 tools, not everything looks like a nail. Something looks like a screwdriver. Something looks like a planer. Something looks like this or that. And so I'm really sort of addressing this issue of the fact that in order for us to heal and, and, and even get to the place where we are ready to um, pay attention to the beauty all around us, you know, you can't see something that you don't have a framework for. For example, when I'm teaching anatomy to my students, I say, you know, eventually I'm going to teach you how to use subtle energy and how to listen to the sounds of a body or how to use your voice to penetrate the body and find obstructions to the flow of energy. But the problem is, is if you don't know what a liver is, even if you do find something there, you're not going to be able to tell a doctor or a therapist or that person what you're working with. So I have to build a framework within you So you can interpret what I'm going to teach you later. And so the point I'm making is our education system is not giving us a framework to have healthy relationships with each other or with nature. It's giving us a framework to be tired, sick, rushed, afraid, and spend our money to medicate ourselves and never really live. So that was where I was going. So that's how you become the, you know, the consumer the only thing we are is a producer and a consumer. We're not a human who has some space and time to learn about themselves and so forth. It's, 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 it's super, super sad. And, and, and you're right. The Confucian, uh, you know, for those of us who are shama- shamanically oriented, we, we think that Confucius is just the transition to consumerism. But um, if you don't know too much about it, and I'm not saying that you don't know too much about it. What you're saying is that Confucius did a really good job of creating an educational system that had that quality of being comprehensive so that a person lives in a larger frame. And, you know, I, I've got a granddaughter who's in college, and I can feel the words coming up in my own, my own mouth that say things like, um, you know, well, what are you going to do with your life? And, and, and then she says, oh, well, I'm going to be an artist or a photographer or something like that. And then I can feel myself saying, you know, and I hate it, uh, but I also just, I'll reveal it. Um, well, how are you going to make money? How are you going to become a part of the consumer machine? Yes, because it's and then, of course, shape. I don't <clears throat> I don't say that to her because I'm conscious enough to be able to shut myself up. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we're on the same page here. And, it, you know, you keep, we all keep asking, well, what should we do? And the answer is breath practice, mind practice, body practice, rest practice, relationship practice, right livelihood practice, have a dream practice. You know, all those things that we keep pointing to are the answer. They're the answer to everything. Yes. And and so I'm I'm going to test your skills as an oriental medical doctor. If you were to consider all the people of the world as cells in a collective being called humanity, and you were to use your skills as an oriental medical doctor to provide a diagnosis and a treatment plan, what would the diagnosis be? And what would we, we've just described the treatment plan? But what's the diagnosis, doctor? Yeah. Now, are we talking about? All biological life or just humans? No, no. Just like humans. you have, you got about 100 trillion cells. You look in the mirror and you call it yourself. If we say each human being is one cell in the equivalent of Roger's body, and the patient comes to you and lays on your table and says, Doctor, what's wrong? I'm curious if you look at humanity as a being, what's the diagnosis? Yeah. Well, the diagnosis is deranged chi from, <laughs> yeah. from the point of Chinese medicine. And what happens in deranged qi is, <clears throat> so, so first of all, let's just say that's the simplistic answer. 
deranged chi. So then you might say, well, is that deranged chi of the heart or the liver or whatever? Well, it's it it it's hard to tell why, because those are not separate parts of a person. So you just can't say, I mean, you can say, and Chinese doctors say it all the time, but I don't say that's your liver or that's your heart. What I say is, uh, if I were to penetrate to the bottom line question of myself as a doctor uh, determining a, um, a diagnosis for a kind of meta person, I would say first that the chi is deranged and that I, because of the, the nature of the three treasures, I would say that the arbiter between the heaven self and the earth self is deranged. Yes, I think you're right. And the arbiter between the heaven self and the earth self by the three treasures is consciousness. So if consciousness has somehow become deranged, whether it's through training or through trauma, what's going to happen is that I'm going to start to reveal, and the the body politic of the human race is revealing deranged chi. And one of the things that happens with yin and yang is that <clears throat> when the when the yin and the yang are close in their their natural interactivity is very different when the, this is according to Chinese medical theory, when the yin and yang are separate. And before you're born, your yin and your yang are separate. And the fact that you become, you become a conception, you are conceived and then are born into the world. The, the yin and the yang come together in a very dynamic sort of way. But at the end of life, just like before the beginning of life, the yin and yang separate. And what happens then is that the body dies. Yeah. And the physical components like the bones and all of that, you put that in a compost pile and later you can't even find it. Right. And then you, you put the, uh, the psyche and the, and the spirit into timelessness. And of course, the first thing that the spirit does with the psyche is, as it's moving into timelessness is say, you belong more with the body than you do with me as a spirit. The ego kind of belongs with the body, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. History and karma and you know all that. Yeah, time, ex yeah, linear time, experience. Exactly. So, so the, the answer to the question then becomes um, that... If we let ourselves develop, cultivate ourselves deeply, we'll realize that we're never wasting time by doing so, that we're getting time, we're gaining time by doing so, that we're reducing the amount of load on the autonomic nervous system so that the natural capacity to make medicine is liberated and circulated freely. And, and so the, the bottom line is, what can we do to make the container for the eternal self more open so that the heart mind, what the Chinese call the heart mind, and it's interesting, in Chinese philosophy, you do not separate the heart from the mind. The goal is to know that the heart and the mind are two parts of one thing, just yin and yang of one thing, and then when the heart and the mind reach, uh, when they reach to a point of um, merging, that's when uh, we're free, and that's when we're totally ourselves, and that's when we are more well, and that's when we are less afraid, and that's when we want to learn more instead of arguing about what we all what we already think we know right you know it's beautiful that you bring up the heart mind i'm going to tell you about an experience i had uh probably around 2006 or so i was just it was the first day of holistic lifestyle coach level two which is our first level for professional training it's a five-day intensive training program and i just happened to be in the front of the class right when this beautiful 
Asian woman, I think from Singapore, maybe, or Sri Lanka or somewhere foreign like that, walk in the door and, and her energy field was the most amazing energy field I've ever seen in my life. I've seen a lot of monks. This woman's energy field was like a tetrahedron made of diamond that was light and it filled the space. <laughs> and I went, I immediately, I looked at her, I walked over to her and I, I shook her hand and said, I have a question for you. What have you done? to make your energy field so incredibly clear and beautiful. I've never seen anybody with an energy field like that in my life. And she smiled. She goes, if you would like, I will show you. I said, I would love it. And there was a bunch of people coming into class trying to distract me. So I took her around the next door over was my office. And I said, please tell me. And she said, do you have a piece of paper? I said, yes. I gave her a piece of paper and a pen, and she wrote in Chinese. And then underneath, she put the translation. Roger, guess what it says? Use your heart to feel what you know. She said, Paul, I've been studying with a master for three years, and that's his only practice. Whenever we get together, we just practice opening our heart and listening to the wisdom of our heart. She spent, I've spent the last three years of my life focusing my consciousness in my heart. And you're the first person to ever tell me anything that gave me an indication that something was really happening. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just wild. I mean, I, to this day, I've never seen an energy field like that. Uh, unbelievably beautiful. Just imagine, you know what a star tetrahedron looks like, right? Yes. Imagine this beautiful field of energy and you could see the density in the light like the edges of the star tetrahedron it was just spinning in this beautiful slow fashion like the moon revolving on its axis and just shooting light through the whole room and just caused a calming effect wherever she went and I was like blown away so right there on the wall is her Chinese writing and the translation and her signature and every morning as part of my prayers to connect to her blower smoke and remind myself use your heart to feel what you know and it's just what it brings up for me is an example of how it doesn't take a complicated practice or a hard practice to really center yourself and grow something as simple as just bringing your mind down into your heart and learning to Put your awareness there and trust that your heart knows a lot that your head doesn't know and listening to it. Yeah. Now, would you, would you say in one word, um, I'll have you say yours and then I'll tell you mine. If you were to say in one word, <clears throat> what is the quickest way to do that? Or a small phrase, what is the quickest way to get your mind into your heart love love yeah and i tell people because a lot of people have a hard time loving i say look if you love plants then just practice loving your plants if you love stones they're easy to love if you love pets love your pets but practice i don't even care if it's your sports car when you're engaging in a love relationship of any type, you are healing and you're actually entering the essence of who and what you really are. And as you learn to love your sports car, then next comes your pets, then your plants, then your next door neighbor or your, your wife or your father. And then you get to the point where you can even love the people that drive you nuts. And then you realize through that love that everything that seems separate is actually one consciousness expressing itself and the act of individuality is the way in which it experiences its own love because if there's not a roger and a paul then there's no uh, agency for love i define love as the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self or other so if that one being or source did not divide itself and produce individuality it would have no way to flow its love into an experience so it created the illusion of separation it's 
to have this amazing experience of being everything at once, but loving it all. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I love your word, and I, I, I'm a, I'm a bro in it. I really get it. And my word is uh, probably goes a little bit to the average person as opposed to you and I, because I agree with you completely. Um, I, I, I talk to people about and support the whole idea of trying on the concept of gratitude. In other words, what in this moment, you know, that I may be feeling well or I may not be feeling well, but I've got a hold of myself enough to ask myself this question, you know, what am I grateful for? And it's interesting because if you talk to people who've just experienced a tragedy and they've lost, like in a fire, they've lost their house, they lost the pictures, you know, the it's etc. And, and they'll say, you know, I'm so grateful that we. We have this little statue that we got when we were on our honeymoon in New York, you know, and they just like reflect for some reason on, uh, I'm just so grateful that my, you know, husband survived this or my wife survived this. There's something in there somewhere that the person can find to reflect on in a grateful sort of way. And it's so very powerful because it just lifts one out of darkness and and pain and the gravity of do lists and, and all that stuff so yeah love and gratitude gratitude and love they're probably the same thing they are they're expressions of each other i mean you can't really have gratitude without expressing love and if you're loving you're already gratitude in action yeah amen, amen. you know you know, you mentioned in your email exchanges with me that you've had especially interesting experiences with shaman. You mentioned Black Raven of the Iroquois, Rolling Thunder of the Cherokee, plus the Hawaiian shaman uh, while you were studying Chinese medicine in, in Hawaii. Uh, shamanism, unbeknownst to many, is the root bed from which all the world's religions emerge from. There is an um, uprising of interest in shamanism and plant medicines at this time, which I feel are the result of those who listen to their inner voice and they can hear mother earth calling them back to restore uh, balance in nature. Um, I'd love it if you could share some of your experiences with these great shaman and what your thoughts are on the role of shamanism and plant medicines uh, as far as their capacity to, to participate or su su facilitate global healing at this important time in human evolution. Yeah. So first let's go plant medicine just for the, for the fun of kind of starting there, and then we'll go to shamanism. Um, plant medicine is uh, stratified in a beautiful array. Everything from plants that are just nourishing to plants that are ultra nourishing to plants that have marvelous qualities of like adaptogenic. So you don't have to. So what I mean by the plants that are nourishing, that gives us the food we need to make the medicine within. The plants that are um, <clears throat> the, 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 the medical plants that we use to treat diseases is to support the process of mobilizing natural function, the medicine within. And then we move up towards um, what the Chinese call the imperial plants, which are the ones that they're not for any kind of disease. They're just for ultimate functional capacity, which we've talked about a whole lot. And those are sometimes called tonic herbs. They're called uh, longevity herbs. They talk about they talk they they also are referred to as immortality herbs. And the reason why immortality comes in there is because longevity doesn't mean living long. In 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 the Chinese tribes, longevity means living long enough to gain more wisdom and with that wisdom to be able to leave something for the people that you depart from when you die, as well as know how to leave this life, as well as to, you know, kind of get on the best bus there is to ride mm -hmm. uh, in case that's possible. You know, like, well, I'm going to take the bus to, oh my God, or I'm going to take the bus to such bliss that I cannot even understand what's going on, or I'm going to take a <laughs> bus somewhere over here that's um, kind of on a trajectory to what I 
think would be the fun next thing to do, which I, I think would be in a completely different universe with a completely different entity without an ego that has to experience time. That would be like, you know, where I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, headed, I'm headed getting for on that ticket. <laughs> yeah. I'm and 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 you haven't mentioned this, and I'm referring to entheogens or psychedelic plants. In other yeah, words, so consciousness go, raising. So let's go on up to the next one. So yeah. the one that we just talked about is generating dimensionally oriented wisdom based on high quality, shall we say, human values. So, so that assumes that you have somebody to learn human values from and that you live in a family that has human values and so forth. And so for those kinds of families, the need for having theogens to be able to open the channel to the transcendental self is much lower. So, you know, and, and I don't know, I'm just going to count myself among the very, very fortunate people who don't have to take a lot of trips to be able to kind of level into this idea of a personal philosophy, which liberates me from fear. So I don't have a, I personally, I mean, maybe I do and maybe I don't, I don't know myself very well, but I don't think I have a lot of things to break through that are really horrifying. So that when I have trips, they're, they're usually, and I, not, by the way, I've not done ayahuasca and I'm not sure that I ever will. Um, so I'm not sure that there's not something hidden within me that I haven't discovered yet, but, you know, with, the the plant medicines that I have used in my life, I've just had really, really great fortune. And so I'm not sure I need a whole lot more and, you know, I'll see how that goes. But the point is that they're there. The entheogens are there. And so then we get to ask the question, you know, what are they for? And for people who've experienced trauma, obviously, we know, because there's all kinds of research, that um, using entheogens with people who have trauma or anger or, you know, just incurable um, diseases, uh, d diseases, but also states of uh, the heart and mind, like sadness and grief. And so, you know, that's very powerful. And when I say my gratitudes, one of the things one of the things that I say is thank you so not so much for not uh, creating the level of trauma beyond what I have experienced. So I have not been present for people who've been suddenly killed by bombs going off. My dad died when I was a little kid. I've been divorced, which was a horrifying experience. But both of those pulled me in to my wisdom self. I, I didn't get shattered. Like in, So now let's go to shamanism. We talked about the, the levels of the plants and so forth. And entheogens are very, very, very powerful. So then let's go to the shamanistic concept, which we were just bordering on, which is the whole concept of the shattered self. So we have the whole self, and then we have the shattered self. Soul loss. And and, and and in the shaman context, that's called soul loss and so forth. Yes. So uh, you asked for a few experiences. So um, meeting Rolling Thunder uh, happened to have the, the opportunity to uh, meet that individual a number of times and spend some lengthy periods of time with Rolling Thunder. And the first time I met him was at the Edgar Casey Foundation in Virginia Beach where he was doing uh, a program. And then following on that, I went to a, um, to a, you know, a, a rural, like a, a, a wild place for three weeks. And we hung and we did chanting and um, sweat lodges and, and, and all that stuff. So I'll tell you one story for each one of these, just very brief. So Rolling Thunder says, we're going to go to the, you know, the most incredible power place. It's just going to be, the place to be so we're hiking and there's mountains over here and there's a river that we a small river that we cross and so forth and and eventually we come to this place and he says okay this is it and you look around and it's like not spectacular <laughs> absolutely not spectacular 
And so by the time we were done with being there for a couple of weeks, you know, there were circles that had to do with like a fire circle, a cooking circle, and so forth, a ceremonial space you know, which was sort of like the space of the absolute and the transcendental. And then there was the kitchen space and the bathroom space, which is basically a reflection of, of, you know, the yin side of life, of just the practical, time-based, go to sleep, wash yourself, feed yourself, pee yourself, poop yourself, all the stuff that has to happen. And so these two worlds were, were created in this very rugged, environment and then we were chanting and doing you know the the hot the hot baths and so forth and we weren't taking any drugs but we were tripping yeah good absolutely tripping so then uh let's just go ahead to rolling thunder i mean uh to black raven so black raven is is uh you know the medicine person is also known as the priest or you know whatever like if you do comparative religions and so forth, that's what the medicine person is. So the first kind of interesting thing is to just generally say, what is the definition of medicine? Yes, that's that a very guy, important question. <clears throat> that guy is not the CEO of a pharmaceutical company. He's just a very humble dude dressed in such an absolutely... Um, what would you call it, uh, average sort of way with a funny hat and, you know, rolling tobacco and so forth. And, and, and so what we know is that what medicine means is that that person has wisdom and they are fearless and they have power. And, and so that's what medicine means. I love it. And I really, really do believe you're bang on. That's the you're real medicine. On. So so here's the interesting story about um, Black Raven is that he showed up. I, I used to live in a place called Athens, Ohio. I had 183 acre forest land there, big garden, built a couple of houses, started a free school, uh, uh, a, a um, uh, food, uh, food uh, you know, food co-op. A gardening co-op is involved in all these things in this rural Appalachian sort of place. And at this one point, I met this guy, Black Raven, who was giving a lecture at Ohio University. And the lecture was based on um, the idea that uh, uh, there might have been Christians in America, you know, through the Mormon, et cetera, and the Golden Tablets, and et cetera. And, um, but when he came off the stage, I grabbed him and, and we became friends. And he, he used to come to the school, which we called the White Oak Learning Foundation, which is Y O L F, Wolf School. And, um, Black Raven would come and talk to the kids and we'd do circles and chanting and set up a TP. <laughs> I mean, it was an amazing, amazing experience. So, we would ask him, like, well, how do you live? And at one point, I actually got to take him to his house. And it was in Columbus, Ohio, which is like an hour and a half away or something like that. He lived in a little tiny apartment, was all messed up. His wife is a white woman who is about two-thirds his size. And so he's like maybe 5'8", and she's something like four two, just like a tiny little person. And um, so everything about his life looks like he could be a, just a kind of a normal white person. And he didn't have really dark skin or anything. like. He had long hair and he could put it in braids and so forth. And he had tools like feathers and drums and so forth. But if you enter into his house, there was nothing in the rooms that you walked into that reflected in any way that he was a Native American, and particularly not a Native American uh, medicine person, you know, with all his natural power and, and, and wisdom. So we say, well, how do you live? And he would say, well, I get money 
from the United States. So if he like he was referencing actually being almost like a foreigner receiving funds to support his life in the United States. And apparently by some treaty or something like that, he had a place of uh, honor in the tribe where he was honored by the government <coughs> as this person who doesn't have to work for a living because he's always ministering to the community. But, so here was an interesting but to it, is that he had to have a medical exam and he needed to have, um, you know, something that would allow him to take certain medicines or that he should take certain medicines, which had to do with his, he smoked pot and he smoked cigarettes. And, you know, I'm sure that he had some kind of entheogen connection that he operated through that we never knew about, but I know was there. So the point there is that this person who is living like ordinary, almost invisible, was a powerhouse of an individual in a particular community, which really means to me, this is how I translate it, <clears throat> that anybody who looks any way they want to, including ordinary, and these days you don't have to seem so ordinary to be extraordinary. You know, it used to be like you had to cover up if you were extraordinary from, you know, sexual gender preference or uh, like a, a utilization of entheogens type preference, or even if you were like an organic farmer or somebody that did Tai Chi, right? I mean, you had to almost kind of pretend that you didn't do those things. Whereas we're deep enough into the Aquarian age, I think that we can, you know, come on out. Well, I, I, I agree, but I wish I could say that it's true. I'm going to tell you what happened to me a few years ago. I was at the Carlsbad Airport. We had like a 6 a.m. flight to L.A. to catch a flight to Europe or somewhere. And it was probably, it wasn't even light yet. The sky was just starting to light up. It was hardly, there might have been six people in the whole airport. And I wanted to do my Tai Chi before I got on the airplane. So I was outside kind of over by the parking lot next to a little garden bed near a stone, uh, a concrete wall across the wall is the parking lot. A cop walks up to me and he says, you have to stop doing that or I'm going to have to arrest you. And I said, what exactly is it that I'm doing that you're going to arrest me for? He goes, you can't be doing those funny exercises. You're going to scare people. I said, I am doing Tai Chi, which has been around for thousands of years, and it's integral to my plan for keeping myself healthy so I don't end up being a sick <laughs> old person. And he goes, well, you can't do that or I'm going to have to arrest you because, like I said, there's people that can see you out the windows and they're going to think you're some kind of a nutcase. I looked at him and I said, you're an ex-soldier, aren't you? He said, yes. I said, I was a member of the 82nd Airborne Division. I said, they made you exercise every day, didn't they? He said, yes. I said, have you noticed how much obesity and disease there is in the world? Yes. I said, then isn't it interesting that you are threatening to arrest me for doing something that's completely healthy? And if everyone in this airport was to emulate me, they would be far the better for it. <laughs> and he just didn't say a word. He just looked at me like I, like he'd seen a ghost. <laughs> and he said, don't do it anymore or I'm probably going to arrest you. <laughs> so as soon as he turned his back and got about 30 feet away, I started doing it. and He never came back. <laughs> That's why he put the word probably in. Yes. Hi, you guys. I know you all know that super green powders are good for you if they're made from organic sources and they're processed properly so the nutrients are there. And that's exactly what Paleo Valley does with their super greens powder. So I brought Autumn Smith in to tell us exactly how she created it and why and what it's going to do for you when you try their amazing organic super greens powder. Autumn, what is the magic you've got here? Well, 
like you said, we all need to get more of those micronutrients that you find in fresh fruits and vegetables. And so we've created a powder that you do not have to choke down. It has an absolutely delicious berry lemonade flavor. And the reason that it's different is because A, it is all organic, 23 organic superfood ingredients. And B, it is a very, very gut-friendly product because what I've found in my practice is that a lot of people don't do well with cereal grasses. And we know cereal grasses, like wheatgrass, can contain lectins that can be hard on the guts of a lot of people I work with. And so what we did was we created a a cereal grass-free alternative. We use high quality, the cleanest, highest quality spirulina on the market, raised in India. And then we added the 22 other organic fresh fruits and vegetables, and the flavor will surprise you. So all you have to do to check it out is go ahead to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase c-h-e-k-15, at checkout. My son drinks it every day. We call it his ninja juice, and I sincerely hope your family loves it as much as ours does. All right, everybody. Go paleo green and get rocking. Hope you love it. So allow me to just speak briefly to the Hawaiians. So so, um, so many things that I could say about the Hawaiian experience and, and learning about Chinese medicine and Taoism in Honolulu at the school of medicine that I went to, uh, which is run by a direct descendant of the first organized Taoist community. Uh, it's pretty interesting. But then the Hawaiian thing was just as palpable. And so these two things were happening to me at the same time, and of course, they're both shamanic. They both arise from shamanic systems. They both have the concept that the medicine is within. They both have the whole idea of resilience and self-determination, empowerment. And so it was really interesting to have these influxing, um, uh, shall we say, data sets about how to, uh, shall we say, navigate towards the higher self in a more sustainable and aware way. And it was an immediate Carl Jung experience about the whole concept of the oversoul or all the other words that we have for, you know, uh, Aldous Huxley with the, um, what was that called? The, the um, hmm, learning the, you know, something, something wisdom, whatever it is. like the, Oh, perennial philosophy. Perennial philosophy and archetypal wisdom. So, you know, you're an archetypalist, I'm an archetypalist, we can put this into a frame where if you put on the left side all the things that we talked about, like, let's say, um, sleep and herbs and foods and, you know, gratitude, and we put all that over here, and then we put all the names of the tribes up above, and then we just filled in the words across, every culture has a chi. Every culture has a concept of bringing the heart and the mind into oneness. Every culture has a, an appreciation for nature. Every culture has the um, overall uh, general framework of attending to the seasons and the rising of the sun, the rising and setting of the sun and the moon and the phases of the moon. They're, they all have that in, in, in common. And so we can take a quick look and say, well, what happened to the humans? Yeah. And the answer is they forgot this. Every version of this has been disregarded in the interest of developing a consumer robot that lives in a biological system, which eventually will not even be able to live in a biological system. So we'll have a robot that we put something equivalent to relative consciousness in so that it will continue to serve, shall I say, the elite, because the elite are going to be living in bubbles, you know, behind big gates. It'll be like Hunger Games. It'll be like Hunger Games. So, but you and I probably can't fix that exactly, but we're going to do what we're doing because that's what we do. And if you're doing what you're doing because that's what you do, then you're probably going to be kind of lighthearted and happy. Yeah, I do what I do because I love living. 
I love relating. I love feeling. I love the sun. I have an intimate, deep relationship with the spirit of the sun. The sun has taught me a million things. So is the moon. So is the earth. So of the stars. You know, I'm a remote viewer. I've traveled all over the place. There's amazing beings on Venus and everywhere you go. I mean, we we just have such a narrow conception of what life is. And we think if life isn't physical and walking and talking like we do, then it doesn't exist. But I'm like, let me, the example I give people is if you want to know how dangerously wrong that concept is, here's a simple experiment that anybody can do. Just go on Google and look for images. You can type in images of Sirius B or images of the solar system with different types of telescopes. And I've seen several images from NASA where they have a picture of a specific star system and they take it with the Hubble telescope, which is a reflective mirror. Then they show you what it looks like for the radio telescope, then an X-ray telescope, et cetera. And they got like five different telescopes. And the most amazing thing is every one of them shows stuff in exactly the same region of space that the other ones can't see. So hmm. you look you look with a Hubble telescope and you see three stars, but you look with a microwave telescope and there's six stars there and you go, holy shit, look at that. So what you realize is that the universe is octaves on top of octaves or dimensions enfolded into each other. And so as a remote viewer, I've, I've meet beings all over the place and talk to them. And some of them look like us. Some of them look very different. When I, I'll never forget, I was remote, remote viewing on the sun. And all of a sudden, these beings approached me. And they're about seven or seven and a half feet tall. And they looked exactly like praying mantises. And at first, I was scared. I was like, what in the world are these <laughs> beings? I mean, that is a huge praying mantis. And immediately they communicated. They could feel my fear. They communicated to me through their eyes. And they said, don't be afraid. We're glad you're here. We'd love to talk to you. And they started talking to me. And I realized these beings are like way more evolved than human beings are. And they showed me stuff. And, and I mean, I could go on for hours about this stuff. But really, we, we really have an opportunity right now to realize that this experience that we're going through is just like being a chicken in an egg. But if you do the kinds of things you and I are talking about and you crack that material egg open so your spirit can reach out first into the world, then to the moon, then to the sun, then you find out that what is going on here is so mind freaking blowingly fantastic that my my real reason for being is I just wish everybody could see and feel what I feel all the time <laughs> because they would realize you don't need your television. You don't need your, your game boy. I got a game for you. Let's go visit some extraterrestrials and see their how they think and how they live. It'll blow your freaking mind, right? So for me, it's like I do what I do because I just – feel like I'm in a nursery school and I got to help the chickies spread their wings and fly because they're, they think all they've got is their Oreo cookies, their coffee and their beer at night and football. I'm like, if you had any idea what you are sitting right in the middle of, it would blow your mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we have total agreement on that. And <clears throat> you're right, we're having what I would call a uh, mildly transcendental conversation here. I'm wondering, <laughs> do you think that the people who are listening are tracking or, or have we? Kind oh, of hell yeah. My podcast, man, that people listening to me, I mean, this is like episode, this will probably be almost 150, I'm guessing. And, <laughs> uh, and they already know that I'm just like, uh, I'm just utterly myself and I don't have any time to be anybody else. So I'm totally digging being me. And that's what I try to share with people. You know, I, my, my second wife, Angie always says, be yourself. Everybody else is taken, <laughs> 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 you know, uh, a quick question before we wrap it up here, you've got two beautiful books. You've got your book on healing and your book on, on key. 
which, how would you, if, if somebody wanted to start with one of those books, is, is one of those books better for a certain population or a certain level of understanding? Or how would you suggest people choose if they had to choose one? Sure. Well, first, I hope you don't mind. Um, can I ask you this question? <clears throat> Do you feel comfortable, um, because I'm questionably comfortable about this, recommending that people uh, go to Amazon? Uh, personally, I think Amazon's so well rooted that they're going to spend money and and fossil fuel, whether it's the postal service or it's Amazon. I mean, I think I I I don't let myself fall so deep into the game that I worry about how my book arrives. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to check the politic on that because. To some extent, you know, I have a real resistance to Amazon, Facebook, Google. Um, well, I, also, I do too. I, you know, we both we use them, and and that's the the, the yin and the yang again, right? I mean, they're there. So then it, the question is, how are you using or abusing? But anyway, so on the, on the books, I have made because it's true a habit of saying, you know do I love one of my children more than another? And would I be willing to say to the public, which one? And so I, I have a hard time with that, but I've got a good answer for you. Yeah, because it's not really which children, it's which child would play best with which mindset. <laughs> so, okay, so let's go there. The healer within is 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 Qigong, um, shall we say, washed and placed into a context where um, a school principal, uh, a stock investor, uh, um, the mayor of a town, a, a teacher, a doctor, a laborer, any of those people who live in an English-speaking country would not find anything in that book except for very rare references to Qigong, Tai Chi, and Qi. Instead, we just call those um, mind-body practices. And, you know, we talk about three treasures and so forth. So the spirit is present, all that. But it's really, shall we say, cleansed for the European palate and the sort of Judeo-Christian sensibility. Right. So it sounds like it's the book for anybody at the beginning level because it's comfortable, it's practical, and you don't have to have a lexicon of Tai Chi Qi Gong language. Correct. And then the healing promise of Qi goes to the whole concept of, well, where did Qi Gong come from? What are some of the low what are some of the low hanging fruit in terms of language like yin and yang? And the Chinese word for heart and mind, and qi, of course. And so there's a, a, a very mild brush of, of um, what leads to very deep either medical theory or, or um, philosophy in that book. So the nine, there's, there's a practice in there called the nine phases. And we already talked about the power of nine. We didn't talk about it very deeply, but the the ancient tribes of Asia really have a power relationship with nine, and they kind of don't really care as much about ten, which is really interesting. And it could be that ten is just a given, or it could be that ten is like almost like dangerous. And think to yourself, if you have a culture that's built on ten, this is what it looks like. When you have a culture that's based on nine, you could say um, the ancient word for tribal, meaning people who live in little clans here and there in a natural environment, that would probably be what that nine looks like. So, you know, there's real power in nine. Anyway, in the, um, in the Healing Promise of Qi, there's a practice of nine phases, which is very, very uh, powerful, you know, we could say, and... You know, I considered many, many years for choosing from, you know, they say there's 10,000 forms of Qigong, which is, I talked to a Korean doctor recently who said there's 35, according to him and scholars in Korea, 35,000 forms of Qigong. I don't even know what that means. But the point is that there's a lot of them. And as a, 
shall we say, as an archivist, I was given the opportunity to choose nine practices from absolutely all the practices of the 35,000 or whatever and put them into a, a little form that's associated with this concept of chi, of uh, cultivating and mastering chi, the nine phases of cultivating and mastering chi. So that one is a little more dripping with qigong feel, whereas the healer within. But then what I would say, if you were going to make a choice, I'd say, well, just make your choice to go to Amazon. Because if you go to Amazon, they're going to give you a discount on both those books. There you go. And so you don't have to choose. You can have them both. Yes. And I that's how I do things. I If I find an author I like, I usually buy everything they've got because that's just how I am. That's how I built my library. I've been a, I love knowledge. You know, I love books. I, I have, you know, probably fought four and a half, 5,000 books right through that wall right there. <laughs> Uh, uh, probably a half a million dollars worth, to be quite honest. Um, you know, it's been a very, very important conversation, you and I, right here today. I think a lot of people, if they're really paying attention, are probably going to leave this feeling a lot less stressed and a lot more aware that what matters most is not complicated and that having a living philosophy is really important and that participating in the relationship with yourself is is really probably the most important key to health and freedom that there is because if you don't know who you are then you don't know where the challenges are coming from or how to resolve it i i have two more questions easy to answer one of them might not be so easy but i know you'll get it if you knew you were going to die tomorrow and you could give a message to the world right now as a parting message, what would you say? I would say, <clears throat> from what I can tell, and this is very personal, and I invite you to have your own personal conclusion. So this is a conclusion that I have reached, and that is that the essence of all of this is in the word surrender or acceptance. And St. Francis had it, you know, what can I do? I'll do what I can do, but then that which I cannot control, I'm not going to fret over. Yeah. And I'm going to ask God to help me. And, you know, when I, when I think about Francis asking God to help him, what he was really saying is the highest level of being, which is where we all commune as, as a oneness. Yeah. I'm going to ask for that to be present in me so that I can get over my fear, which which um, urges me to try to control things. So that's why I say, and I really appreciate the context we've been in here, Paul, because usually when I'm interviewed, I have to talk a lot about research and um, really practical stuff that builds to the point where we can talk about Qigong and conscious living in a way so that people will understand and, and uh, because we referred it back to science. In, in this conversation, we've gone to the old science, which is you don't gather data from a lot of places and try to get it all to say the same thing, where some people are right and some people are wrong. You say everybody's right and you pay attention to everybody when you listen to their truth. So if I open up a channel just because I'm curious to know about the plants in my environment so that I can water them at their proper times, know the people that I meet, know the people that I work with in such a way that I can be open to being so curious about what they're experiencing that the extent to which what I wish was happening doesn't really matter. That's beautiful. That's freedom to me. You've just described a free man. And, you know, we should all be free men. We should. And, and know, women. <laughs> I, I, I think of myself as free because I make choices in my garden. I'm free because I make choices in my nutrition. And I'm free 
Right now I'm doing some masonry uh, work, but I'm not using cement. I'm using sand and the clay that's in the ground right here. Love it. To, My kind of stuff right there. Yeah. So I make, you know, it's kind of like the bottom of a little pyramid that I probably won't ever build because I want to, I want to put a tea house there instead. But the, the measuring and the leveling and then mixing up the mud and putting sand and the water and all that together and then laying these stones in a certain way, that to me is like, that's all medicine. It is medicine. And I'm just dosing like crazy. Right, right in this conversation with you, I am just. This is not micro dosing. We're on big doses of the cool stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We're on. We're on the elixir, man. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's 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 not hard. I mean, <laughs> I get so much joy lifting stones and building. stones sculptures out of rock and mandalas on the ground and taking my kids out there and I teach classes on it. People just have their mind blown. And I say, people, you know what the beautiful thing about lifting, making something out of stone is? If it falls over, it doesn't matter. You just learn to just enjoy the whole process. And if it falls over on the last stone, you say, that's my beautiful workout I just had. And <laughs> now I don't have to pick it up. Uh, take it down tomorrow I'll start over again and do something new and, and it is a workout it's yeah a workout for your muscles and for your I soul think to myself at what point am I kind of done with all the things that I want to build and then how am I going to keep myself well I'm going to do kung fu of course that's that's exactly how that works but you got a workout you design something you found the stones you lifted them and carried them. You put them together in a certain way. They did or they did not fall down. And all of that is just, you know, the Tao, the, the, you know, the ancients in China would say that the Tao is just expressing itself with big chi. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any specific offers on anything you wanted to uh, share with the listeners today? Sure. So, so uh, we have a couple of things that are very accessible, and we have a couple of things that you buy in the store. Well, if you get my books, you could just go to Amazon and spell my name J A H N K E, which I'm sure is in the notes. Um, we also have some streaming programs. We have a streaming program called the Healer Within Medical Qigong Video Library. Great. And so that's. Every practice, which is in the healer within. Great. And there's actually a bunch of short videos, but um, they equal a, a, close to three hours. So it's three hours worth of very short videos, which you can use for the rest of your life. And then the other one is a, a program that we have called Breath Medicine. We'll have to meet again someday and have We'll just talk about the breath alone because, oh, my God, the, the physiology of breath practice and the portal to transcendence that are happening at the same time, you know, and everything that it has, to, the only thing it has to do with is consciousness deciding to change the pace and depth of the breath. It costs nothing. So the program has a little cost, but you can use it for the rest of your life for no cost. And you could be making big medicine and opening a big space for the presence of spirit in your own being. Very, very powerful. So those are the two that I would put up. And then, of course, we do trainings of teachers. And I talked about the Circle of Life coach training. So we have a whole Circle of Life. You know, you can look these things up. Um, Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi and Circle of Life Coach Institute. You can just look, look those up and Google will take you there. Excellent. And I'm hoping that we uh, get to stay good friends, man. This yeah. has been like, you know, you're my favorite. You're like my new best friend because how often can we have these conversations? Yeah, it's hard. It's sad that it's not easier. But, you know, what we're really talking about is living and loving and enjoying life. And I think we need to give more airtime to the people that have practiced that and less airtime to the 
you know, who's screwing who and baseball <laughs> wives and mob wives and whatever the hell else is going on out there. But I, I've really enjoyed it. And, and in many ways, you've helped me by just bringing me back in touch with why I do what I do. And, you know, hanging out with you is, reminds me of hanging out with Master Fong Ha and just that, that beautiful grace and simplicity and just my own reminder to get not let the world get too deep inside of me, you know, don't get too mm -hmm. caught in the game and the show and, and the rat race. And, uh, you know, I do very good, but I'll tell you what, spending a, a three hours and 21 minutes with you has really brought me back to remember, Hey, you, you know, as much as you do, you can still let go more. Don't, don't let the world get too much under your skin. Because sometimes the warrior in me starts turning on. You know, I used to be a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. So there's a real ass kicker hiding under oh, the skin. Yeah. 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 So. Well, I love the fact that you guys, and usually guys, but women too, um, you know, people say, well, thank you for your service. And, and I, I do thank you for your service. But the main thing that I want to say is that people in the military know about mission and they know about inclusiveness to the extent that no one ever gets left behind and so my biggest sadness about the military is that and 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 i basically did not have to go to the uh, war in vietnam for one reason because i was going to move to canada i became a, a preacher in the universal life church i did Weddings. I did everything to be able to be a conscious, conscious objector. But then eventually, they did a thing called the lottery, and my number came out to be three sixty three. So I was like free. But to be able to get to that point, I really had to reckon with myself, and I have so much compassion for people who, and and and, and um, respect for people who went into the military, and here's my sadness, is not the injuries. I mean, yes, I'm sad about the injuries. What I'm sad about is when, when veterans return home from service, the concept of mission and inclusiveness completely disappears, and they're forced into these complex consumer-based environments. And the trauma is just so palpable and there's no reference points for seeking the path to freedom which we are describing and and so uh thank you for your service but mostly uh, okay i'll put this out to you here's a let, let's we'll do we'll do a dare let's i dare you to collaborate with me to do something for veterans specifically. And we can do it or not do it, but I'm just like, you know, putting out there a, 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 like an invitation for future collaboration. Yeah, well, let's see what we can do. I'm in the middle of writing a new book, which will be my 12th one, but it's the most important one I've ever written. And it, it'll be for every veteran and every person that can read from about 12 years of age up. Um, I, I think, you know, what I was referring to by mentioning that I was a paratrooper is this, there's an, a natural warrior urge in me to defend the people that don't realize what's happening to them and how it's happening to them. And I do. So I can spot the enemy and know that this is a very dangerous enemy. And the enemy actually turns out to be our own people, which is really even more dangerous. So sometimes I get uh, a bit stressed as to how can I do more for people in the world right now? And you're doing it. Yeah. You know, but what, what, what really, why I'm bringing that up is because hanging out with you made me realize I can relax more and still do it. So I really appreciate you bringing that to me today. Right on brother. Many, so thank many you. blessings for you. You too. And, and, and thank you for sharing all that you have in your books and your videos on YouTube and 
teaching people all the things that you do. And, you know, I can tell you, you can leave the world when you do knowing you left it a better place. And, and I think it, anytime we can do that, then it's been a good mission. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Lots of We're love home. to all of you. Yes. Take care. Lots of love to all of you. Thanks to my sponsors for all your amazing products and your sustainable practices. Thank you to each of you for listening and sharing. I hope you love this episode as much as I did. Dr. Jonka's the real deal. There's no question about that. If you are listening right now, then you know that's a fact. And uh, thank you for anything you buy from the sponsors. A little commission goes to me when you do that so I can fund the podcast and have the time to do it and find great guests like today for you. So let's all grow together. Share the love. Remember my rule. If you love the podcast, share it. If you didn't, it's our secret. See you next time. Aho, great spirit. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Dr. Roger Janka. You can find Dr. Janka online at iiqtc.org. That's iiqtc.org. His two books, The Healer Within and The Healing Promise of Chi, are both available from Amazon.com and all good bookstores. Dr. Janka is offering listeners free membership to the Tai Chi and Qigong Way. Visit iiqtc.org forward slash member to subscribe. You can also save big on two of his programs, saving over $75 on the Healer Within Medical Qigong video program by going to bit.ly forward slash L4D Qigong. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash L-4-D Q-I-G-O-N-G. No promo code is needed for this special offer. Or you can save $46 on his breath medicine program by visiting bit.ly forward slash L4D breath. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash L-4-D B-R-E-A-T-H. And again, no promo code is needing to get the discount. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at Paul Check, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, chickiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast.